It's time for Windows Weekly with Paul Thrott and Mary Jo Foley. Your next enterprise device might be a Chromebook. The Fall Creator update is much ado about something. Last rights for Gig Jam and Intel polls on Microsoft. That and more coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley, recorded August 23rd, 2017. The Foley Skew. This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash windows. It's time for Windows Weekly, the, the show that stores your precious digital data much better than Crash Plan. I'm Father Robert Ballester, the digital Jesuit in for Leo Laporte, who's currently at the podcast movement down in Hanaheim, California. And of course... Got the stars of the show, starting with Mr. Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley, currently the, uh, I'd say, the, the center of the Microsoft universe here at Twit. Paul Therott, of course, <laughs> the, is the... The gooey center. The nougaty center, <laughs> but also the certifiably mad genius behind uh, Therott.com. He's the purveyor of news, reviews, and analysis for tech enthusiasts. And, of course, Mary Jo Foley, the mastermind behind ZDNet's All About Microsoft blog. Together, they're here to give you news about Microsoft, like the finest cheap box wine, really fresh and barely touched the press. You know, box All wine Mary is Joe. getting pretty good. <laughs> it, you know, I'm just saying. It, I, I got to say, it's been a while since the last time I've, I've sat in this chair. Uh, I, I think it was uh, last September, really. I am somewhat confused by that. I, 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 mean, I know I saw you in January. I, I saw you. I'm thinking there might be one that I've missed, but according to my notes, I haven't had a Windows Weekly since since late I last mean, year. Let's That's look. Strange. Let's go to the tape, Bob. I, I, don't, I don't know if we do tape anymore. but uh, Number 532. That's today. Yep. <laughs> I have 422 in 2015. Oh, boy. Well, yeah. whatever it's been, it's been way, way too long. Uh, I agree. Yeah, this is one of uh, my favorite sub jobs whenever Leo goes away because... <laughs> I get to I get to talk about something that I truly love. I'm I live in the Microsoft world. I use Windows as my primary OS. Uh, it's what I do most of my work with. And so anytime I God, get I to, love you. to talk with people <laughs> who actually deal with this world, yeah, I love it. I love it. Yep. <laughs> now, uh, of course, we uh, we need to talk a little bit about uh, something that I've been seeing more. We we uh, have been getting yep. Microsoft to the desktop on more devices, and uh, Microsoft seems to be okay with. Office 365 showing up on iOS and Android devices, but there's been one big incursion onto the business desktop that I've seen as of late, and that's Chromebooks. Now, Chromebooks, not too long ago, they were really kind of a joke. They were cheap. They were one of those things where, okay, maybe you buy one for your grandma so it doesn't get infected by viruses, but it would definitely was not business class hardware. Um, mm. Recently, I've, I've seen businesses that I've been helping have yep. genuine plans to replace mobile devices with Chromebooks. So this confuses people. On? This <laughs> confuses people. It's but happening. actually, before we get to this, I, I'm curious, Mary Jo, if you don't mind me asking, yeah. um, because Mary Jo threw the notes together this morning, uh, yeah. which is great because I was in a travel-related coma. Um, <laughs> why would you put this story first? Yep. I'm, I'm curious about that. Uh, so I'm, I was really intrigued when this got announced yesterday. I didn't know about it in advance. So th there's this new thing called Google Enterprise. And it's mostly about mobile device management for Chromebooks, right? Yeah. And like Padre just said, up until now, Chromebooks, you think of them as like maybe for the education market, kind of not that serious for businesses. But this feels like Google saying, hey, we know there's a segment of businesses out here who actually could live on a Chromebook. And why, why I thought it was significant for our show is it kind of reminded me of what Microsoft is trying to do with Windows 10 S, I think. 
Oh, except Google's doing it successfully. Um. <laughs> so we had a big fight last week, Padre, on the show. Yeah. Like there was actually shouting at one point. Ooh, I like yeah. that. About uh, people Windows don't like it when mommy and daddy yes. fight, you know? They don't. <laughs> but it's, people I, there are was, like, but you guys were was a good reason for it because, um, <laughs> you know, Mary Jo was wrong. And I, I just... Uh, <laughs> um, hmm. Well, since then, no. many people have written to say they thought I was correct and that you were really not so correct yourself um but fair. okay yeah. fair enough i i will be impartial <laughs> i will say you're both correct and you're both <laughs> right wrong. i would have said we're both wrong <laughs> yeah, either one is fine um right. so no, so I, I, I thought it was significant because of that the comparison with yep. 10s but also active directory integration is part of this new bundle yeah, that google's that's selling that's huge right i know and that's the enterprise right? part right because google yes. has actually long offered um, work management capabilities, like you were saying, MDM-based capabilities uh, to smaller businesses, right? And you can manage Chromebook uh, in a G Suite uh, online admin console, much like you can an Android device. In fact, not exactly the same, but it's it's very similar. And uh, this is kind of what puts it over the top for an enterprise. And it's it's not expensive. It's fifty dollars per PC per year, yeah. uh, which is pretty impressive. So I have no idea how well it works or how it works or what or anything like that but based on my experience with chromebook over the years i agree with what padre said it started out as kind of a joke we all made fun of it and then one day we woke up and oh, actually this isn't too bad <laughs> you know <laughs> yep. and in keeping with what you said with my uh, discussion about windows 10 and my belief that it's a 10s rather that it's really not uh, ready for any audience at this point mm -hmm. you are correct that they are hitting the same uh, audiences in some ways, right? And so education is a big part of it, but also business. And the one thing I do yeah. know is that uh, either IDC or Gardner, I can't remember which, but when the, uh, not this past quarter, the quarter that ended in June, but the quarter before that, the PC market almost uh, didn't slow for the first time in mm -hmm. five years. Like in other words, you know, PC sales have fallen every quarter, year over year for, for five years. That quarter... If you average the results from IDC and Gartner, it was like it was like a one percent decline. It was almost flat, and I can't remember which company it was, but one of those two companies credited Chromebook adoption in business for it not being worse. In other words, Chrome, there were certain segments of the PC market that saw great growth: premium PCs, gaming PCs, and Chromebooks, <laughs> you know, now the interesting thing about that in a way, one of the interesting things is that the other of those two companies, I can't keep them straight, doesn't even include Chromebooks in their own numbers when they look at the PC market. Yeah. So the one that does is seeing growth of Chromebooks in business. Now mm -hmm. we know because we deal with uh, readers and listeners, uh, the people who live out the United, uh, outside of the United States in particular are here listening to this conversation and they're saying, what are you talking about? I've never... I have never seen a Chromebook in my life. And for whatever it's worth, um, I think like you guys and like people listening to the show, when I travel and I see other people with computers on the plane or the train or wherever, I, I always look and I, you know, what's there? Oh, there's a MacBook, there's a ThinkPad, there's an iPad, whatever it is. Mm. I never, I, I never see Chromebooks out in the world. No. But are you sure? But, <laughs> but are you sure? Because a the lot of, is, a lot of Chromebooks data, look like Windows boxes now. That's true. That's, that's true. true. That's it, true. That's you, true. I'm not always sure if something is a Chromebook. Like when I when someone's like, "Yeah, this is a Chromebook," I'm like, "Oh, I thought it was a Windows PC." Okay. <laughs> Actually, there is one Chromebook we see regularly, right, at industry events, because there's one reporter who uses a Chromebook that we see, and I always pointed out, like, "This, this is kind of goofy. Let's go haze them." Um, but <laughs> <laughs> so mature, you know. That's, yeah, we all have a, a shtick, but. Um, mm. I think that in the United States, uh, a lot of the Chromebook install, the Chromebook purchases are obviously schools. So you wouldn't see them out in the world. They're in a lab. Um, or kids are bringing them home from school. Or there are people at home who want a, a cheap you know, a second computer or just a computer to augment their smartphone or tablet. And I think that's where the real value of this stuff is because Apple is trying to contort like the iPad to turn it into something you can type on and everything. But it's really not an ideal form factor for that. And then we have this Chromebook thing, which started off as, like you said, a very cheap and uh, kind of low-powered, low-capability type of device. But, you know, it has a keyboard and a trackpad. And it runs mm -hmm. the browser everyone wants to run. And there are a lot of web apps available for that browser. And, oh, my gosh, right now they're adding Android apps. It's taking a long time, but they are doing it. And uh, the Chromebook that I've been using most recently finally got that support recently. So I was able to try that for the first time on my own hardware. And it's 
it's really interesting. It's super buggy. Right. But I do sort of feel like this is the, the secret sauce that kind of puts this over the top. And so the big difference between Windows 10S, I would say, and Chromebook is that Windows 10S doesn't have the browser that anyone wants. <laughs> but if you can contort yourself to using it, if you don't mind running web apps in tabs, not as like apps, it's okay. But the problem is they don't have the store. You know, the the they do have a store, but it's terrible. Like there aren't really any good apps. So it's kind of a weird mix of stuff. On the yeah. Chromebook side, you have the browser everyone does want to run. The web apps run efficiently and beautifully and as apps, which is really neat if you want them to, outside of tabs. And now they're adding Android app support. And Android is the most populous uh, mobile app store in the world. And so mm -hmm. it's you can it's funny you said you know in your notes it says so maybe Microsoft wasn't so crazy thinking that Windows 10s might be or might appeal to business users. In, in some ways I would almost say that the the drive for Windows 10s might in fact be their real world realization that this Chrome thing actually does make sense and they need to answer it. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, that, the add on the add on question of yeah. that then is then is Microsoft too late? Because Windows S could have filled mm -hmm. a niche if people had that that uh, epiphany, the realization like, oh, this this is going to help me do everything a bit more lightweight. But now that yeah. we've got Chromebook, something like uh, I've got an Acer R13, and just like yours, mine does Android apps, and I'm I'm thinking uh -huh. if I can do MDM, real MDM on this, not some it, sort it of watered MDM. down version. Mm -hmm. yeah then yep. I absolutely would buy these and distribute to my employees because they're inexpensive. I can guarantee data security and they're going to run the Android apps they already run on their phone. Yep. Yeah. That's I a mean, great value I think, proposition. I think Microsoft That's, is trying to make that case too in the fact that they put 10S on the Surface laptop, which is a premium device. And I think right. we talked about this a couple of times on different Windows Weekly episodes, but there, I think there is a group of people who are knowledge workers who need a browser and they need email and they need um, office. And that's kind of all they need. I and I feel like this is who would be the audience for Chromebooks. And I think this is who could be the audience for Windows 10 S. So I think that, bo that uh, both of them are trying to go at this the same way. And Microsoft obviously has mobile device management through Intune um, and now in these new bundles they just came out with, um, Microsoft 365, they've got that as a whole package. You get Office 365, um, a lot of the enterprise security and mobility stuff, and Windows 10 in there too. So there's a, a different ways you can get at it if you're a business customer. And I don't know, I think they both see the same thing. Like not everybody is a power user. Not everybody needs... Um, Windows Pro or Windows no, 10 no, Pro. Probably, that's workspace. absolutely correct. I mean, uh, yeah. but yeah. Uh, you know, the, the point I was trying to make last week um, was that you, you're wrong. No, is that. Um, <laughs> no, the, is I, that, I heard you. Um, <laughs> Mom, Dad. Um, <laughs> um, no, is that there, there is a, 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 a transition that needs to occur before we can get yeah. there. You know, it's, it's funny. Yep. Chrome OS, as originally envisioned, Chromebook or whatever wasn't really a particularly viable operating system. I feel that Android app support is what puts it over the top. I mean, they've improved mm. it in other ways, too. Um, but I, I think that's the final piece of the puzzle. On the Windows 10S side, I think the problem is the store is so lackluster. And uh, yeah. native, maybe uh, I should say sophisticated support for web applications is not there yet. It's something that might happen in the next version of Windows 10. So it's just a little head of the, it's ahead of the curve a little bit because the capabilities aren't quite there. But you're you're very you're very much correct that Microsoft and Google saw the same thing, which are the same yeah. trends. And I think what it's related to is the, uh, the the shrinking of the PC market and the rapid rise of the mobile device market. And that a lot of people, yeah. regardless of who they are, they could be professional business workers, they could be students, they could just be average people, whatever it is, can do most of what they want or need to do on a smartphone. And sometimes mm -hmm. they have to turn to this other machine where they open the laptop and they have to type. Maybe it's a, a long paper for school or they want to, um, you know, edit a document that's something at, you know, something at work is related to or whatever. But for a lot of the time, just for answering email and basic communications with the people they work with or their friends or whatever, the phone is satisfying that need. And so the issue there is for that, what I believe to be the majority of people out in the world, whoever they are. You know, a full-blown Windows 10 Pro or whatever computer is too complex, too expensive, too much. Mm -hmm. Whereas, yes, Windows 10S, if they can get it right, or a Chromebook, it, it kind of hits the sweet spot. And, and you know um, what? 
Um, on the on the hardware side, though, there's this interesting thing that you you're. You and I kind of see this maybe a little differently. Like I feel like there is a, the, these people who are knowledge workers like me, we aren't necessarily the people who want to use an iPad, right? right like right, I right. don't find an I don't find a tablet to be the right device for me when I need to do real work. I, and I feel like I, that's I, I couldn't that's why more. there are Chromebooks, yeah. right? And that's why there's yep. a Surface laptop. Yeah. <laughs> It's just look. And that's why I think 10S PCs could actually be interesting to business users too, because some people are like, yeah, you know what? I don't really want to do work on a tablet. Like there is a, obviously a group of people who for tab, you know, mobile workers, people out in the field who need to write notes on, uh, you know, with a stylus, whatever that they need a tablet, but there are other people I who need to sit down on a PC and type. Let, let, me, let me jump in here real quick because we've got, uh, we've got Quicka in the chat room. Who's he's mm -hmm. expressed a sentiment that I think was the reason why most of us poo-pooed Chromebooks at the beginning of their lifespan. And mm -hmm. that is, I don't think Android app support is going to make much of a difference in business. That's just a yeah. plus for the consumer side. And I get that. I understand that's where I used to be oh, until I, I realized right. that whole wall that we used to put mm -hmm. between consumer right. and enterprise, yeah. that's, it's maybe not broken down, but it's definitely porous. And now mm -hmm. my users yes. expect well, way, to be able to use, use the apps. Let's use Microsoft as the example here yeah. because- this is a Microsoft show, but we're talking about work, right? So if you have a Chromebook with a web browser, you can run the uh, the Office Online apps, the web-based things, which offer a baseline of functionality. They're okay. Um, there is a full-blown Office suite to be had, obviously, on Windows desktop and also on the Mac. But in between those two things are these Office mobile apps, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, um, OneNote, uh, Outlook, actually, and then uh, Sway and some other apps and things like that. Um, if you believe my contention that most of the world can in fact get by with just a phone most of the time, but sometimes they need to type. Mm -hmm. That version of Office satisfies that need for most people. And I, I that is the thing. You know, Mary Jo, you we, we always joke, you know, Mary Jo writes in Notepad or whatever. Um, I do. But we are, <laughs> well, I know you do. I mean, but we, I mean, we joke in the sense that it's impossible that you actually do that. I mean, obviously, you, you're joking. It's, that's you crazy. see me do this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know you do. It, it, she does, actually. But you know, even professional writers, um, but whatever, um, people who need to do spreadsheets occasionally, people who have to make presentations, people who need to share notes like we're doing now, like you're using the web-based version of OneNote. Well, guess what's better than that? The OneNote mobile app, <laughs> right, which yeah. you could run the Android version of on your Chromebook. Um, yeah, that's what I was so going to yes, ask you. So so both of you guys, like what, what are examples of Android phone apps that you think would be interesting to business users? Well, the uh, the Office apps. That's the, the I mean, yeah. another what I just described for, for starters. The 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 Microsoft Office apps, not just the core apps, but things like Sway and so forth. The the yeah. issue on uh, Chromebook with the Android apps is you know just generally buggy. You know, at least in my experience, some of them are written to be literal phone apps, and so when they come up, they come up in kind of a phone shaped window, and you can expand them to full screen. But when you do, all it all it does is kind of stretch it out. Ideally, yeah. what you get is uh, a tablet version of the app. And in the case of the core office apps, meaning Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, but not um, Outlook, interestingly, uh, what you get is the tablet version of the app, and that's what you want. So you can run it in a window, you can run it full screen, and it looks like it would on Windows 10 or whatever. It mm -hmm. looks and works like it would on Windows 10, I should say. Um, but it varies from app to app, and that's the thing. I mean, um, I think the Achilles heel for this stuff right now, aside from just the general bugginess is the unpredictability of the experience. You don't know when you run the app if it's going to be a like a phone app or a tablet app. Right. Mm -hmm. And frankly, because the Android tablet experience hasn't taken off in a meaningful way like it has on phone, there aren't a lot of really good tablet apps for Android, in my experience. Um, obviously, some things like games and whatever would, would probably be okay on the big screen, but it seems like a lot of the apps I try are just stretching out a like a phone app. And right. I mean, that's not a great experience. Yeah. And, but, you know, now Microsoft's also working on a version of um, the Office app specifically for 10S, right? Um, well, or they're, rather I mean, they're like wrapping the, yeah, I forget oh. how they're doing this. Centennial. Oh, you're right. right. It's, a, it's Centennial. Yep. Yeah. And by the way, that's a huge advantage for Windows 10S right there. It is. Yeah. But, yeah. but is it? Because, I mean, most Android yeah, users is. are going to think, well, I, I already use 365 via an app. Do I really well, need something listen, that's native? But remember, so, 
I, I, I spoke about the transition. We talked a lot more about this last year, uh, last week rather. My, my big problem with Windows 10 is that it's just kind of boom, like the, the bridge just comes down, it closed, we're not doing anything. You're either mm. doing this or you're doing that. And um, what, what, I, what I mean by that specifically is you can't run Chrome, let's say, on Windows 10 S because Chrome is a desktop application. It can't be ported with Centennial, even if Google wanted to do it. And Microsoft says they're not going to change their rules and whatever it is. Mm. Um, I feel like there's a compromise where these things could meet in the middle. But a Microsoft app, like Microsoft Office, uh, Microsoft Word, Excel, whatever, they are going to do the work to port that to Centennial, meaning that a, um, a business user or any user could choose to run the full desktop version of those applications on Windows 10 S, even though they were designed for the desktop, which you're not technically supposed to be able to do. That's the transition. Because if you're trying to sell a business with multiple seats, on some new system that's limited in so many ways, one of the ways you can do it is say, well, hold on a second. You can run the version of Office you're already running. Your users already know it. They're not going to have to mm -hmm. have any training right. or whatever, and that is a huge advantage. Um, if you want to go to Chromebook, not only are you learning a new system, it's simple. I mean, every you know, taskbar, whatever, it works a lot like Windows. But that version of Office you're getting is kind of like a half-hearted you know, mobile app version. It's not the full experience that you're used to. For some businesses, Fortune 500 companies in particular, I would think, like more sophisticated businesses, mm. that actually might be a problem um, mm. because they are used to the full version of Excel or the full version of uh, PowerPoint or whatever. Um, and so that's why you see today in the Chromebook, uh, sorry, the Google Enterprise, or I guess it's Chromebook Enterprise thing we're talking about, that one of, the, one of the ways you get this to work is, well, okay, Active Directory integration, great, there's your identity stuff but you need some way to run Windows applications in this environment. And there are virtual environment, uh, virtual app uh, capabilities. I think they mentioned one from VMware today that yeah. will allow that on Chromebook. And that's another way you can kind of help aid that transition in happening. Okay, mm -hmm. so let me ask a question of both of you. How much time does Microsoft have to get S right? Not just the OS, but all the supports, all the apps, make it non-buggy, make it a seamless experience. <laughs> before the enterprise just says, oh, yeah, Chromebooks are fine. We're just going to go this way. So I think, I think 10S is right. Um, oh. I think I do, <laughs> but I think, okay, okay. I think, I think um, what's not right is the store. Um, yep. yes. So if you're somebody who is okay with just using like me office and some of the built-in things like notepad and, and those basic utilities and a browser. And like I mentioned before, Edge almost works for me at this point, not not 100%, but it's getting there. Then yep. I think I think they're there. I think the thing they have to do is get more business apps into the store using Centennial because that seems to be the the most likely way that you're going to see some traditional 132 apps get into the store. But that that store is a big that's a big if, it's a right? Disaster. It is a big it's, if. It's a big it's if. A disaster. Yeah. So let me let me offer two potential compromises that I think make more sense in the short term. I agree that getting to what you just described is the goal and should be the goal. Uh, and that if the store was was stocked with great apps, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Um, one is you can, you can treat Windows 10 S users like the adults that they are and actually give them a switch in the operating system. It could be painful, but where they kind of go through a series of steps and, and they say, look, we know you want to run Chrome, but when you do that, it's going to run a startup process. It's going to slow your performance over time. It might harm your reliability. Um, you know, we try to make these promises with Windows 10 S and you say, yeah, 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 I know. Just let me run the damn thing. It's all the software to run that is in the system. It's just disabled artificially. It's not like it's not there. You know, you're not saving disk yeah. space or anything. Right. Um, you could do that. Treat, treat the users like adults and let them make the decision that's right for themselves, even if it's a little painful. Um, the other one they could do, and this is maybe a technical and or a legal challenge would be allow the operating system or uh, I guess design the operating system such that it contains apps that you install. It does the centennial thing to those apps on the fly. In other mm. words, you download Chrome or paint.net or whatever it is, and without you knowing it, or maybe they could even flash a little message, hey, we're making your computer safer. It throws that thing in a container. Mm. It basically does what Centennial does, and then it installs it in your system. Now it's isolated from the rest of the operating system. It can't bring down the computer, et cetera, et cetera. This is uh, this is the most simplistic thing I've ever said on the show, potentially. I know there are tons of technical issues with, with what I just said, especially with applications that do run auto, um, run install, yeah. you know, uh, updaters and so forth. But mm -hmm. I, I feel like 
the problem with Windows 10 S is that they're putting the onus of it not working on the user, <laughs> you know, mm. and that maybe Microsoft could make some compromises to make things work better. For example, they could allow Google to use their rendering engine in a Centennial or whatever version of Chrome. Give the people what they want. I mean, do you think the, Google these, would do that? I don't. Uh, they, they I, would think have Google, to be, uh, I think Google uh, yeah, loves. I think Google loves that they're no, um, listen. hampering Microsoft. <laughs> I know, but by the way, one of the ways you can hamper Microsoft is by allowing Microsoft's users to install a Trojan horse on their computer that is a platform oh. in its own right. In other words, right. mm -hmm. let people get access to those Chrome apps and the web mm -hmm. apps and all this stuff that all works great today in Windows mm -hmm. 10, which is the real reason Microsoft's not allowing this. When when Windows, uh, or sorry, when Microsoft Edge is evolved to the point where it can run web apps in is as sophisticated a fashion as uh, Chrome can, I bet you'll suddenly find them making all kinds of comp compromises well, on Chrome. It, but it's right not now, just the web apps, though. Right. I mean, one of no, the no, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying it. I mean, right. It's okay. web notifications. There's all kinds of things. It's, yeah. you know, they added the ability to pin uh, edge uh, websites from edge to the taskbar in the fall creators update. It is the most ridiculous, unsophisticated <laughs> way of doing that. I, I, it is crazy how dumb it is. Mm -hmm. uh, even Internet Explorer in previous versions of Windows, actually probably in, in Windows 10 too, can do that better than edge can in the next version of Windows 10. I can explain that if you're truly interested. It's not a super interesting topic, but it is just, it's dumb. And I, I this capability has been around for a long time. Microsoft did it. Uh, uh, Google does it in Chrome. I, I just, I don't know. It's really, it's just disheartening. Yeah. I, I think, I think the, I like your container idea, except I think for third-party apps, <clears throat> that's problematic I, because you need third-party developers to actually agree in some that's way, thing, right? right? That's what I meant by legal issues. I think that yeah. there could be an issue where Google said, hey, what are you doing? You're, you're yeah. essentially, you've changed my <laughs> proprietary yeah. software. The way I run. That's illegal. I know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I know. I, like I said, it's the most simplistic idea I've ever had. But I, I but I'm, <laughs> I'm, what I'm trying to do is work toward I know. something I, that I, I think you. is a viable compromise. But, but guess, it is viable, I guess, right? I mean, th this has been Microsoft. So. The new Microsoft has been... I want to get Office 365 on your device. And if they're really yeah. focused on that, then right. exactly Edge, right. Edge is not a bad browser. But as you as you mentioned, it, it's missing a lot of apps. I miss my continuous <laughs> one sign-in that I have on all my Google Chrome devices, mm -hmm. from my phone to my, my laptop to my yeah. desktop. Give me that. You know, Give me some sort of adapter for that. It's funny, and I might um, consider you just, it. You just touched on maybe what is perhaps the best argument for what I'm saying, which is that I think the one thing we would all agree on is that job one at Microsoft is to push the platforms that make the most sense for them. And, and by most sense, we mean, you know, most revenues, most right. profits, whatever. Um, Office 365 proliferating across platforms mm. makes way more sense to Microsoft oh, yeah. than Windows 10. Mm. Because Windows 10 is, a, it's, it's, it's stuck. It's on the PC. It's the market is whatever mm. size it is. Office 365 can explode outwards because you've got the cloud, obviously, but you have these mobile platforms. There are what? How many smartphones? Number five billion or some 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 billions of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there are one billion probably dropping every day Windows PCs, but there are 500 million running Windows 10. If you allowed Office 365, if you allowed Chrome to run on Windows 10 S, you would you could achieve t a twofer. You could get they would they might still use Office 365, and they would actually be buying a Windows license, right? I mean, in yeah, but in many ways. It just doesn't hurt to do it. It it it's but think it doesn't about, hurt but, the platform that matters. But uh, but I think it does because if you let <laughs> people do what Padre wants to do, it means he he wants to do it because he uses Google's apps, right? And oh. Microsoft's trying to they're, what they're trying well, to do is box you in, right? <laughs> like they're like we want you to remember. use Office three sixty five regardless of platform, and we want you to use our browser. Um, because the most well, used you, application on yeah, a PC like, is a browser. Using it. Like, what's the win for Microsoft when you use Edge? Like, what's the win? Micro Windows 10 has already Bing. has full office. I use, use Bing on Bing. Chrome. Bing is my default yeah. on Chrome. It, it, always, it always felt to wait, me as wait, if wait, wait, Edge... Stop, 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 stop. Oh, wait, did you just wait. actually say that? I do. <laughs> no, I'm... I, I, hey, wait, wait. Can you go into than Chrome you and change it? it? Could you go? Could you go to my, my screen right now? Okay, I'm going to open up a new tab. I'm using Chrome. Oh, well... Mm -hmm. Okay, so it didn't do it this time, but it's supposed to do that. 
It's it's yeah. This is yeah. my Chrome. This is how so it works. Bing is your default search, and on I think on Windows 10 S you can't still change the default search engine from Bing, right? That's correct. Right. Yeah. But yeah. Edge, I, I'm with pennies. I'm with you, Paul. I don't see the the Penny. value here from Microsoft sticking with Edge. Edge almost felt as if it was an apology for IE. They said, no, we we <laughs> can actually do this, but we're past that. They, we, no one cares it's too late. if I you use asked, Edge. You said Windows 10 S. Is it too late? I would say yes. I'll look at the cat. Oh. That but also, um, by the way, it looks like the cat has accepted you. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, is this a what, new What's that? I think the cat said Windows 10S makes no sense. Yeah, no, this is a smart cat. <laughs> he heard the word Bing and he left immediately. <laughs> wait, is there is there really hate for Bing? I actually love Bing. It is my primary. Yep. Really? No, I no, like, no. But know. there is is ambivalence. Okay. Yeah. I like it. I like it for certain things. Um, but I, I still use my... Um, default search as, as um, yep. Google. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Sorry for the sirens. They're coming for you for 10S. <laughs> I was wondering which which person's home that was coming from. <laughs> <laughs> like around here, it's more like an Amish wooden buggy with like a bell. Uh, do, do we need to talk a, a more about actually using a Chromebook or are we ready to move away from Google's uh, contamination of the Microsoft ecosystem? No, I think we I think we hit on most of it. I, I guess the only thing I would say is I've spent uh, now over three weeks evaluating. Uh, actually, I haven't used it in the past couple of day, days, but for the for well over two weeks, I used Windows 10 S at least part of every day. You know, you, you get the blogger going thing where the guy's like, I'm just going to use Chromebook for two weeks, you know. Um, I, I knew Windows 10 S wasn't going to work, um, so I resolved that I would also use Windows 10 Pro, uh, and I tried to split my time. And if it did work, I mean, I would have been honest about that, obviously, um, but it, it, you know, it just didn't work. So, it, as part of my move, I, I got back to the new house where all my computers were st stocked up, and I pulled the Chromebook out because I was curious. I had gotten Android app support, which is really neat, and so I said, "Well, I'll I'll play around with this for a couple of days again." and the only, the only thing I'll say is just that I felt like using Chromebook was easier and for my workflow, and this is very personal, I mean, uh, for the things I do every day, right, writing, posting, uh, getting an image, cropping it and resizing and getting that into the WordPress um, system, uh, the Chromebook worked way better than Windows 10 S did for me. Okay. So uh, that was, you know, again, it's not, it's, I don't, I don't mean it's like a come up and say, I'm not Microsoft, I'm not responsible for this kind of stuff. But, you know, like you said, for many years, I had kind of thought of Chrome OS as kind of a joke. The Android app stuff got me very interested and excited. I saw that as a potential game changer. And then I watched as Google kind of delayed and delayed it. And I was thinking, you know, what's going on here? Um, I think the process of getting that stuff going has been a lot harder than they thought it was going to be. And you can see it. I mean, when you run the apps, it's like, Mm, yeah, this isn't. This is kind of half baked, but you st you can still see the promise of it. It's very interesting. Paul, that was incredibly level headed, very well reasoned. Um, <laughs> absolutely brings me brings me more into your camp uh, now. Mary Jo Foley, can you tell me why Paul is wrong? <laughs> no, I I think I I my our point last week where we disagreed was, um, he said, Mary Jo, there's something wrong with you because you think you can make this work. <laughs> I know I'm I quoting him that. verbatim, she's, she's clearly. basically. <laughs> I, uh, I, yeah, I went back. So, did. by the way, the reason you, you might have noticed, I think you did notice, I tweeted that line a few yes, days later. And yes. the reason I did that is I, I did something <laughs> that I never do, which is I went back and I watched part of an episode that we recorded because yes. I remembered I, re, I remembered saying that and I I had hoped that it was clear that I meant it humorously. No, I, it and I was. Went back, <laughs> I went back to watch it just to make sure. That it was no, delivered it was. in a humorous way, not as, in like some kind of a weird, exasperated no, way. it was fine. Uh, but but I, yeah. my only point to that was I, there is a group of people like me. I'm not the only one who's weird who could make this work. Like there, there are people who are information workers and even people who are senior level management types who don't really sure. need all the stuff you, you, you guys used, like video production um, and those well, kind of things. By apps. the way, even I don't need it. The, I mean, the truth yeah. is, for the most part... Um, you know, I, I screw around with you know, programming languages and programming environments and things like that. And, you know, I do edit graphics from time to time, and, and that's a little bit of a stumbling block. But from the, the, the focus of what I do day to day, writing pretty much and posting the things that I write, I mean, yeah, Windows 10S or 
Chromebook should work just fine. A Mac would work just fine. Obviously, that's a full-powered computer. Linux would probably work just fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. As much as it pains me to admit that. Um, so, <laughs> uh, you know, would would uh, an iPad Pro work fine? Actually, the answer is no. Uh, and I've spent that's another thing I've spent a lot of time evaluating this summer. In fact, I've spent more time. Well, not anymore, but I, up until the last two weeks, I had spent more time on an iPad Pro with iOS 11 than I had on Windows 10S. Um, that is a completely, completely messed up. So that, that thing is turning into the most <laughs> yeah, bizarre yeah. Frankenstein's monster. Um, and I'll be writing about that soon because obviously iOS 11 is coming to a conclusion here. But yeah. we, we'll, we'll, we'll save that one for next week. Yeah, <laughs> for, that'll be for now, let me just dump this. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Paul, Mary Jo, uh, we're going to take a break here. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the new Fall Creators update, which is amazing. Millions of new features and updates. It's an entirely new OS. Paul and Mary Jo are going to tell awesome. you all about it. I can't it. wait to hear about it. It does. <laughs> <laughs> this crazy thing. But, uh, of course, we have been speaking with uh, Paul Thrott, Mary Jo Foley. Paul of Thrott.com, Mary Jo Foley of the All About Microsoft blog. Let's take a break, though, because we need to thank a sponsor of this episode of Windows Weekly. Now, folks... When you think about the great challenges of life and, and the great rewards of life, those experiences that you love the most, of course, there's raising your family, there's the great accomplishments, and there's getting a mortgage. I mean, that's one of the most entertaining things that we can possibly know. Of course, it's not. Getting a mortgage is a nightmare, which is why we're happy to have Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans as a sponsor of Windows Weekly. Now, the mortgage experience wasn't keeping up with the digital experience. It was dated. It needed a client-focused technological revolution. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence that you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Now, it's simple. It allows you to fully understand all the details and be confident about the right mortgage, about the fact that your banker is actually on your side trying to get you the deal, the rate, the, the terms that make sense for you. It's also convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. No more going through boxes of old receipts and pay stubs and then bringing it into a bank to try to prove that you are who you are and that you earn what you earn. It's also powerful. Whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds and give you a comparative analysis. Oh, based on your income, assets, and credits, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of the home loan options for which you qualify and then find you the one that's just right for you. It's Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. You can apply simply, understand fully, and mortgage confidently. Uh, to get started, just go to rocketmortgage.com slash windows. That's rocketmortgage.com slash windows. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of Windows Weekly. Okay, so we That's get to the fun happened. part. Hold on. Oh. Guess what just happened? I just got the Outlook.com try the beta. Try oh Are you serious? You actually got it? I got it. It just came in. Yep. How come you get wait, hold on, I gotta check now. No, I didn't get <laughs> so, it. No, no, I'm gonna, how dare you? I definitely didn't get it. <laughs> yeah, because there's a way to trick it to so you can try the beta, but I actually didn't I I mean I did it once and then didn't do it again. But now I just got the toggle that says try the beta. So it's coming. It's so really we, coming. We can, I still do not have it. We can, we Although can, I have like a URL I can go to just to, it will load yeah, the new URL. You were the URL last URL. one to get the new Outlook. <laughs> so you're going to be the I last one. I do, I do like the new Outlook. So what, what do I get with the beta? It's pretty. Uh, you get a new, new look and feel um, that looks very nice, actually. It actually really is nice looking. It, it really mm -hmm. is. But I kind of um, know where everything is already. I don't need it. I know. It doesn't know. really change that much in terms of how it's laid out. It looks pretty much the same. I mean, there's some new buttons along the left pane um, for like all your photos that you send or receive and emails are organized in one place. That's pretty cool. Um, Wait, is this, this, like this, this, this focused thing that I get in the Outlook app? No, 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 no. not that hate. horrible thing. Can they kill that, that, please? Hate. You do get it. Hate. So <laughs> much hate. I don't. I don't know anybody Joe, who thinks Mary that Joe's was a good second idea. Second favorite feature in Outlook.com: <laughs> conversation view and focused inbox. Conversation Ooh. view and focused inbox. That's right. <laughs> yep. I, yeah. the, my um, favorite part is I still get the little pop up saying, "Hey, do you like this feature?" It's like, how many times can I tell you that this feature needs to burn in the depths of hell? <laughs> <laughs> they need a button for that. Many, 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 many. 
Uh, by the way, this is a quick follow-up to the, the Chrome OS thing. Um, I see a story that uh, a coming version of Chrome OS is going to add basically Snap View, right? So um, it will do what Windows 8 started doing, although poorly, which is the ability to run two apps side-by-side -side and then kind of resize accordingly. Um, cynically, you might say, well, here we are five years after Windows 8, and they're finally adding this functionality. But to me, what this shows is the modernization of the uh, – uh, mature, maturization of this operating system because a lot of new Chromebooks are two-in-one devices now with touch screens and pen support. And that kind of thing actually makes sense on a device that sometimes will be a tablet where you can run those Android apps and sometimes will be a laptop. And um, actually, <laughs> you know, that makes this is another example of how this thing is kind of moving forward. You know, we don't really pay attention to a lot over here in Windows land, but it is, you know, this is happening. Yeah, and actually happening a lot more quickly than most of us thought yep. it would happen. That's right. That's right. Or actually that it would be capable of happening. The enterprise moves slow. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Rightfully so. Rightfully so. Yeah. All right. So Mary Jo's got a new outlook, but all of us are soon <laughs> going to have a new fall creator update, which is going to be incredible and awesome and do all these new things, right? Yeah, let's spend the next 30 minutes talking about the new features. Do you have one of those um, we'll be right back uh, wave files you can just play that? Dun, 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 dun. The old yeah. under construction gif that just, mm -hmm. just yeah, keeps yeah. running away. Yeah. Um, I, I'm i looking through this. I don't see anything. But you know what that means. Can I say anything? Yeah. But no. So it's just because of where we're at in the cycle, right? Right. <laughs> like we're right now we're at the point of it should be all bug fixes and no features because they need to RTM this. I guess I said it. Um, pretty soon. So they shouldn't be adding features. They added a couple of minor, very minor things today, but like at this point, it should be all fixes because we're, we're yeah, closing we're in saying. on it, it being done. <laughs> oh, this piece yeah, is on, very... uh, this is 16.251. And I, as far as I can tell, the only thing that they fixed is it now doesn't always crash out some of my apps. Um, <laughs> that's about well, it. That well, seems like 16, a huge plus. Yeah. yeah 16.273 just came out um, at 1 p.m. Oh, today. Well, then I'm probably going to have a little prompt later on today. Actually, the desktop yep. at home is probably already updating then. Yay. <laughs> I, I also there noticed are, are, uh, 251. Sorry. I'm having problems with uh, with some of my Ultrabooks. So I have, I've got five Ultrabooks that do all the updates. And they're doing that thing again where when I put it into standby, yep. just yes. randomly they'll come back alive and they'll kill my battery or and or heat mm. up uh, the cover yeah. where they're stored. I've experienced this on my Surface book um where i thought man i thought we were past this you yeah. know mm. so, but, yeah. I, but it is on the insider preview so maybe hopefully that's all it was <sighs> i hope so but yeah because <laughs> the power power management it it used to be sort of an optional but when you're when you're dealing with uh -huh. these it's it's not an option anymore it has to work right the first time yeah. every yep. time okay oh, anything else yep. other than stability updates yeah give me well, there, something there, I, there are two things related to this that i think are interesting one of which i couldn't possibly explain if my life depended on it um and that one is that they've added a a, a new ring to their ring system for insiders so you know there's like the fast ring and the slow ring and now there's this what's it called skip ahead ring or whatever yeah, so skip ahead. we're because we're in this kind of transition a, a different kind of transition between the previous Redstone 3, I think it was, and then Redstone mm -hmm. 4, which is the next release. Uh, Microsoft briefly gave people the ability to jump forward to get on RS4 testing, and then they froze that, I guess. And now what mm -hmm. they've done is kind of explained how this thing will transition over the next couple of months. And um, I'm going to leave that one as a, an exercise for someone <laughs> else. I can't <laughs> understand it. I'm, I've been traveling and stuff, and I read it, and I... <laughs> So I, I, I can try. Um, so they did split the rings to set up for Redstone 4 testing to begin. And, you know, as, as, is, as happens when they start testing a new build, at first there are no new features, right? They're doing a lot of under the covers work. So people who are in the skip ahead ring, they're not going to see a bunch of new features right off the bat. They're going to see Microsoft jump the build number way up to the next thing. And then they're going to see some tinkering going on under the covers stuff. Um, changes around one core and all that. Uh, and that's it, right? <laughs> they're they're not going to be seeing these fast fixed builds that people who are in the current fast ring will be seeing as we get closer to RTM. But Mary Jo, I mean, emoji. Nice. I get emoji now, right? I <laughs> yeah, mean, this, so, that's huge. Yeah. 
Right. If you're in if you're in the fast ring and not the skip ahead ring, you did get some new features today. You got um, the new emoji notification capability. Oh, uh, brother. OK. Um, Yay. And uh, you you can sign up for a new Windows Insider Uh-oh. emoji bot. To try that out using emoji notifications in my people. And then you also get a new font. So I don't know a whole lot about fonts, but there's an open type variable font called Bond Shift that is now included in this build. And the little I understand about this is this type of a font doesn't mean you have to um, be limited to different type styles like light, medium, bold. It gives you the whole range of styles and weights. And Microsoft says save a lot of space. So those are the kind of really small things they're adding right now to to uh, the Fall Creators update because they're almost done. Okay, so this new font, it's revolutionary, <laughs> right? Oh, so are you asking us? I'm not, I see now. You're asking us what is going to be in the Fall Creators update, right? Yeah, that too. Yes. Okay. Okay, so these are just really tiny things that are in the Fall Creators update. If you yeah. if you're an enterprise user, <laughs> there are going to be a lot of new security. Okay, um, features. lay this on me. This I like. Yeah, let me know. Windows Defender um, Application Guard is one of these, and and it acts um, kind of like a um, what would you call it? Almost like a container, right? It it isolates potential malware in a container. Um, there's a whole bunch of things under that Windows Defender. Um, family brand name now that are coming to you, but only if you're an enterprise user. Uh, I think a couple of months ago, Microsoft listed like eight or nine different things coming if you're an enterprise user and you care about security. So they're all um, yep. new additions to that family of of Windows Defender um, advanced threat protection uh, type stuff. But if you're, if you're a c- consumer slash creator. Well, actually, hold on. There's uh, there are important um, improvements to Hyper-V. Oh, which right, will impact right, business users. Yes, um, yes, correct. Task Manager can now uh, monitor your GPU, which is actually kind of exciting, but okay. more applicable, I guess, to everybody is they actually broke down some processes in there. So that it, like things like Microsoft Edge, you can actually see the exact tab names and so forth, which is kind of exciting. OneDrive Files on Demand. Yeah, how, how did oh. I forget that? So the replacement for placeholders, Padre, is in this one. Okay. And Remember also place- your favorite... Yeah. <laughs> I love your favorite application. More of that. Also, I've uh, heard that they've changed the the uh, nature of the F three key in Edge. Now, <laughs> you F three key. F three will find the next thing, and Shift F three finds the. Oh, previous like a thing. normal browser. Yeah. Also, yeah. speaking of things that work normally now in Edge, uh, F eleven for full oh, screen. Okay, hey, you know that's yeah. that's always nice when it you know it's how it's supposed that's to be. That's true. <laughs> Actually, by the way, I mean I I make fun of Edge because it's terrible, but. It does get slightly less terrible in every release of Windows 10. And I, I mean, and to be completely fair to it um, and to Microsoft, this is probably, for me, the biggest release of Edge because it solves the problems that I think are real world problems. You know, in previous releases, they added things like, you know, an ebook store and, and you know, PDF reading and, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, this one includes such basic items as performance improvements you can actually see. So, for example, in previous versions of Microsoft Edge, actually in current versions of Microsoft Edge, when you right-click on something in that browser, there's like a one-second pause, and then that UWP-style menu appears. In the new version coming in the Fall Creators Update, you right-click, and the menu just appears, just like a normal menu. And I know it, it sounds like I'm making fun of that, but that that kind of slowdown every single day, every single time you hit it, is the type of thing that drives people away, that it just works now in the Fall Creators Update, I think is actually kind of a big deal. Mm. Now, I, I do want to break more. that down, though, uh, just a little bit, Paul, but before before we get to Mary Jo. And that, yeah, go ahead. It, it sounded like you said Edge is terrible, but if you keep yep. using it, you get used to it being terrible. No, I that's not that. what you were um, saying. It's I didn't, although it is a little bit like, you know, any terrible situation, you kind of just adapt to it. Um, no, what I said was it, it gets slightly less terrible okay. with each release. <laughs> OK, that was meant and to be an does. endorsement. I mean, look, <laughs> that's each, well. Look, it, it supports website pinning in this release. Yes. Terribly, yeah. but it does. Okay. Yes. And it, and look, it, it, I, I will still give it this. It is the best at using touchscreen for scrolling. It's so much better than Chrome. Yeah. Okay. Um, that could be true. That's, that could be yeah, true. Less well, stuttery, right? It's very yeah. stuttery in Chrome. It, it wants to jump, whereas yeah. with Edge, it does feel smooth. So right. there's definitely a difference there. I like that. But yeah, okay, yeah. Now, Mary yeah. Jo, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. 
No, I was just going to say there are more more add-ins coming. Um, you know, with every version, there's more add-ins. But people ask us this all the time. They're like, why doesn't Microsoft decouple Edge from Windows yep. and make it a store app and make it yeah. updatable whenever they have new features? Because that would make me more interested in trying it. Mm-hmm. And we've heard they are planning to do this someday, but yeah, it's puzzling they aren't anymore, why it doesn't though, happen. Because, yeah. Wait, I they think, aren't anymore? Yeah, I think there's a problem here because there is some low-level... <laughs> integration that's occurring here just like there was with internet mm. explorer which is preventing yeah. them from doing this i, I clearly really? this thing would benefit from even monthly updates right yeah, i know um, hmm. and I, they're yeah i did I don't they think say they're, they're not going to do it yeah i gotta try to f- remember where i heard this um, oh man because i didn't hear line, that was, and that's twitter disturbing. or something like it was someone from the edge team i think they basically said oh. yeah we're not we don't really have a plan for that right now Oh man! We covered Jeez. this a little earlier in the episode, but what's what's the game plan there? I mean, why are they so invested in Edge? Why can't they? Why can't they decouple? Why Edge, must it so, be by the way, part of the experience? Edge, Edge is, is is interesting. Edge is literally the exception to every rule in Windows 10. So, for example, <laughs> if you decide, no, it is. It's 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 kind of fascinating. I I don't think Edge is a pure UWP app, even though they sort of say that it is. I really don't think it is. I think it's a hybrid app that utilizes desktop and UWP technologies or however you want to say that. I don't think it is a UWP app, a pure UWP app. But mm-hmm. aside from that, you know, one of the interesting things about Windows 10 is that you can choose to sign in as a local user, a local account, just like you did in, you know, older versions of Windows, or you can sign in with your Microsoft account. If you sign in with a local account, you could go to any of the apps that require a sign-in, uh, the Windows Store, for example, or right. the Mail app or... Uh, the Photos app or whatever, and you can sign in to that app. So you could decide on an app-by-app basis that you're going to provide a a Microsoft account sign-in. By the way, you could apply a different Microsoft account to every app if you wanted to. The exception is Edge. If you don't sign into Windows 10 using a Microsoft account, you can't use all of Edge's features, most specifically its uh, sync features for settings and so forth. You have to sign in with a Microsoft account to the operating system. You can't sign into Edge. It's the mm-hmm. only app like that on the system. That's a you know a UWP app supposedly. Well, um, I mean, but and I that is how I Android think works. That's how Chromebooks work. If you don't uh, if you don't log in with a Google account, it, you mm. I mean you can't use the device. Yes, but when uh, Chrome is based on the browser, um, right. in Windows 10, Chrome uh, Edge is just an app. It's still just an app, mm. and that's what I mean. I, there is a deep level of integration occurring with this app. Yeah the operating system that I don't think we understand. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe this is a goofy example, but I think you can kind of see it a little bit in that lack of sync capability. But I think where you really see it is in their inability to separate it from the operating system and just make it available as a standalone app. By the way, mm-hmm. it's also possible that they know that once they did this, someone could get a hold of it and make it run on Windows 7 with no problem or something like that. You know, it mm, could be something right, because related. right. That's that's another thing people have asked for. They're like, could Microsoft please bring Edge to other operating systems, including other flavors of Windows, so that I can have that right. continuity, right? And yep. so far, their answer publicly has been, we don't have any plans to put it anywhere other than Windows 10. Yeah, uh, I I think it would make more sense for them to support cross-platform sync of bookmarks, yeah. uh, right. passwords, settings, Absolutely. whatever. Um, if they, you know, in other words, look, we, we accept that you're going to use Chrome on Android or maybe you're going to use Safari on iOS or whatever it is, mm-hmm. but we want you to use Edge on Windows. Well, here's a way yeah. you can facilitate that, that would right? Do it for me. Yeah, it would do it for me too, Absolutely. by the way. I, I'm, yeah. yeah. So yeah. maybe the reason they can't or won't is because of what you're saying. It's too deeply integrated with Windows. Yeah, I can only guess, but I mean, that's my guess. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I think it's... It just feels so strange. It's It's like... Windows 10 and Office 365, that's the new Microsoft. Edge is the old Microsoft that wanted to silo everything and keep everything in their playground. And they're not playing yeah. well together. The new, the new Microsoft is um, winning big time at Microsoft, yes. I will say. But there are little mm-hmm. vestiges of the old Microsoft. And yeah, this is, you know, by the way, Windows 10 S in, in a way is the old Microsoft too, in the sense that this thing was developed in secret non-transparently, completely different from the way they do everything else. Um, and I argued a month and a half ago that they needed to bring this thing to the insider program and let people, mm-hmm. like, I've, I've voiced my opinions, you know, Mary Jo has. Um, how about letting the body of enthusiasts who actually really 
care about this stuff provide you with feedback, you know, and they've declined to do that until, by the way, this week, they finally uh, just opened it up to the insider program. All right. Speaking of the insider program, um, mm -hmm. we're all going to get a chance to play with S, yes? Finally. Yeah, that's what, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yep. as of today, yep. Now, it is as of today. Yep. Any Anybody who's in, do you have to be in the fast ring to do it? Uh, nope. Um, but there mm -hmm. are some caveats. Um, Windows 10 S isn't, it's where the, the installer is not an ISO. And so what they do, what they have is an online installer. So you have to run it from an existing Windows computer. It has to be okay. Windows 10 Pro or Enterprise. Um, and oh, I think the okay. reason has to do with licensing because in their licensing structure, Windows 10 S is above home and you don't have a valid, a valid license for S if you have home. Why is Anyone could install home? it and not activate it. What's that? Why is S above home? It provides less functionality mm -hmm. than home. So yep. S, S <laughs> technically, if you go by Microsoft's verbiage, S is a mode of Windows 10 Pro. Yeah, which it isn't, by the way. <laughs> okay. That's what they call it. Well, I, well, here's, <laughs> by the way, here's a better way to think of it. I, I think I, I don't know if I said this or wrote this somewhere. The better way to think of that is Windows 10 Pro is a mode of Windows 10 S. It's the mode of right. Windows 10 S where you can run desktop apps. Yeah. That, that is actually the distinction. And, and the other things like the, the console applications, um, I guess those are desktop yeah. apps. You know, Hyper-V, whatever. Okay. I mean, but basically, I, I think the reason they call it a mode is it is Windows 10 Pro just locked down, right? That's, right. that's what 10S yeah, it's is. Like when, um, if you park illegally and they put a clamp on your wheel, that's like a <laughs> mode of your car. It's a mode where you cannot drive. Well, I drive a Toyota Corolla. That's like a mode of a Ferrari, right? So it is. Yeah. I get it. I get it. It yeah. all makes sense. Yeah. It's a punishment, one might say. <laughs> now, what's uh, what are the hardware requirements? Uh, anything I have that will run Pro will run S. No, no. Just if, fine. You, if you're if you're running Windows 10 Pro, you can run it. Okay. okay. And supposedly it should work really well with a convertible, with a, a touchscreen. All all the S features that I've seen. By the way, I should be able. To we are with. literally just about to find out. So uh, okay. because people are actually going to start using it. So. I, like I said, I, I tested it over the course of two weeks. I wrote a bunch of articles about it. I, you know, kind of investigated such areas as hardware compatibility and how drivers work. You know, one of the issues without having desktop applications is you don't get those driver sets that have all the utilities and stuff because those are DOS, you know, they're, I almost said DOS apps because those are Windows desktop apps. And, um, you know, gaming and, and we're going to see. So people are going to start plugging in multiple monitors, all kinds of different hardware devices. They're going to run them on all kinds of different hardware platforms, different device types. We're going to see. So I think the next couple of weeks are going to be really interesting there. I, I, I bet it's going to go pretty well from a basic compatibility standpoint, though. In the, I think it's, it's like this. In the release notes, there was nothing about rolling back and forth, was there? No. There is a way to roll back. It's called nuke it from space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, because originally that was that was the question, right? If you yeah. went to Pro, could you ever go back to S? And you could. But of course. that was yeah. kind of a but You need to have that to way to do it. So in other yeah. words, the, the question at that time was with Surface Laptop. And at the right. time it was asked, Microsoft didn't have a recovery image available on Surface or, you know, support.surface.com mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, now they do. So you can't go back. In other words, you can't flip a switch and just go back to Pro. Um, but what you can, or I guess back to S in that case, um, you can't flip a switch and go back and forth. You can flip a switch. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, we're getting mixed up. So, if you have a Windows 10 S, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, if I mentioned I've been start over. About, start if you over. Have a Windows 10 Pro <laughs> computer today, and you want to test Windows 10 S, you can install it. But it, the it, the installer runs, and it comes up, and it says, "By the way, we're going to kill your entire computer." Blah blah blah, whatever it is. I think you can save. I didn't run through it, but I believe you can do that thing where you can it's like save documents, probably, or something like that. But what it's really doing is wiping out your system and doing a clean install, and then applying everything back. Uh, it's not an upgrade, right? It's a, it's, it's really like a side-loaded clean install. Um, you can't go back to Pro from that, though. Well, well, well wait a minute. So it's a side-loaded <laughs> install, but there is no start. ISO. So if you wanted There's to install no it on on bare on right. bare hardware, you have to install 10 Pro first, and then install this side-loaded. Oh, okay. Except for one thing, as it turns out, there is an ISO available from a different source because a couple of weeks ago we talked about this and docs.microsoft.com right. or whatever it is, or docs.com. Um, they actually did make an ISO available. Now, the problem with that is you're not going to be able to activate it. And so the question is going to be, would this thing activate on an existing PC that already had a Windows 10 Pro activation, like a valid license? I actually don't know the answer to that. It's possible mm -hmm. it would. But I, I, just to complete the thought, I just want to say, if you do have Windows 10 S, and I would imagine regardless of how you got it, 
could be wrong about this, but I think you should be able to go to Pro because that's the in, that's it does do an in place upgrade to Pro. So you would have you've had this Pro system that had whatever it had on it. You went to Windows 10 S. You probably lost everything except for maybe your documents and some settings. And then you install some apps. You did whatever you're doing. You're like, you know, this thing really stinks. I'm going to go back to Windows 10 Pro. There, there is a, a UI in the OS that lo lets you do that for free right now. The question is, would it pick up on the Windows 10 Pro license you already had on the PC? And I think the answer to that question is yes. Well, I mean, that, um, license, yes. that license should be yeah. tied to your, your right. account. That's right. That's yeah. right. So, mm -hmm. And to your account. That's true. So now, uh, but what you're not doing is kind of restoring it to what you had before, right? In other words, maybe you had like Adobe Photoshop on there and iTunes and, you know, the desktop version of Microsoft Office, whatever it was. Um, you'd have to reinstall all that stuff. You know, it's it's, it's not like a, you're not right. just transitioning between modes. You're reinstalling right. operating systems. Um, so you can go back. This is all, look, this is for insiders. It's technical. It's for technical people. It's, you know, yeah. the advice is always the same. If you're worried about this computer, if this thing matters to you, well, don't use it for starters. But if you're going to, <laughs> back it up, right? Before you do anything, yeah. make sure make sure you have that ability to restore it to what it was. Anyone can download a Windows 10 Pro ISO. That will probably work fine. But if you get something from a PC maker, that's always better. If it's on the disk, better still. Um we could do an entire series on this. Well, I think none none of us are using Insider on a machine that we don't that we can't do without, right? I mean, I I don't have uh, it on my primary machine. <laughs> yes, that's right. Oh, <laughs> Paul, that is insanity. I I I have sacrificial machines that will do my Insider build. This this is running Insider, but I I know at any given time this might go out. I actually have, I have another. One of these S7s, it's in my bag, and it, it's running straight Windows 10. I have nothing but sacrificial systems. <sighs> but the important thing is, I I'll, like, I'll always have something I can turn to, right? So if right, right. this thing falls apart on me, that would be terrible. But I have laptops and whatever. So and it would be a great okay. story. Sure. <laughs> you know, Jerry Purnell always used to say, I make these mistakes so you don't have to. I make mm -hmm. these mistakes because I'm an idiot. And then you can blog about it. At least you could learn from my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, I'm not sure if that's a, an up note or a down note. I, it's I good. <laughs> it's, we've got Insider, but yeah, there's a couple of caveats that go along with it. Uh, yep. Mary Jo, you're, you're going to be running S on everything, right? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> it has no pet. No, it has no pet. And I, that was a concern, and it does. Um, but I, I could run S on everything if I wanted to, um, but I'm I'm just one of these people like most normals. I run what comes with the machine that I buy. Yeah. And if it's home, I'm running home. And if it's running pro, I'm going to run pro. This, this and, is an incredibly yeah. healthy attitude, and it's something I I cannot understand <laughs> because I feel like I, I I get out of sorts when things work too well, or when I'm not running beta software, or yeah. you know what I mean. You, yep. you, like you, gotta, you have like, to feel the growing edges. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah. I think so. I mean, I think I'm here to represent the normal contingent for this audience. And yep. that's how we, we would think. You've heard it here, folks. Mary Jo Foley <laughs> is the normal. A normal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, speaking of normal, it's, it's not just a desktop. We actually have a nice little bump in the Insider Preview for server. I believe it's 16267. Uh, is. What what do we get? So this build that came out yesterday is the third insider preview for Windows Server 2016. And what you get are mostly all fixes and no features. Although I did have somebody who downloaded it point out to me that the nano server uh, download in this is way, way smaller. And Microsoft is shrinking that as we knew, but uh, that's one of the few things that may be new in here. Uh, and just like client, they're getting really close to finalizing this and, and saying it's done. That's why you're not seeing new features, especially in server. You know, like servers is in a place where you like, hey, let's add 10 new features now that we're almost <laughs> ready to release it. Well, but hey, you can do hey, emojis guys. in the console, right? At least <laughs> right. <laughs> they've made some concession. Yeah. Yeah. So p people who are insider testers for server are very happy that there are not new features at this point, I would imagine. Um because we're this almost, has happened we're pretty almost quick, done. right? From a, a tester's yeah. perspective, you know, Windows yeah. Server 2016, well, 1709. What a great name, by the way. Um, <laughs> Simple, like you said, this is the third insider preview. When, when was the first? It was like two months ago. I mean, it was yeah, maybe a month or 
so ago. Yeah, yeah it, it wasn't kind of, long this ago. This thing kind of came and went. Yeah. Also, the optimization—it's—it's you know, it's actually impressive. I mean, yes. Okay. So the the the, yeah. uh, the nano server is seventy percent smaller, which is already amazing. Mm -hmm. But the yeah. core, the core base image is yep. twenty percent smaller. That is a huge amount of optimization. Yeah. I would actually love to see what they did. What what did they see, get rid of? What did they compact? To me, nano server that makes more sense than Windows Ten S. Throw a Notepad on there. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> that's, so that's, Paul, that's going to be your new desktop. You're running server. <laughs> yes, I'm going to run nano. Yeah, I don't hate myself enough. I'm going to I'm going to go full GOI-less. It's going to remote session in. Uh, let's see how Skype works on that. Yeah, so you, you guys probably remember this, but la over the summer, oh. Microsoft put out a blog post and they said, by the way, you know, we are changing what nano server is supposed to be because in Windows Server 2016, it, it was kind of like our idea that this should be the default version that everybody goes to because it's more secure, et cetera. But then they came out in July this year and said, nano server is only going to be a container based OS image. That's, that's what it is going to be now. Right. So it's, it's I got a much more specific purpose now. And that's why you're seeing Microsoft shrink it way down. Um, I actually, I think that makes tons of sense, by the way. I, I realize I don't yeah. cover the server world kind of like I used to, but when I think about things like server core back in the day and the nano server, uh, and you look at the way the on-prem server market is evolving to kind of meet the needs of you know public cloud, whatever, um, having it turn into something that is essentially a containerized system is, uh, to me, yeah. actually the the logical way to go with it. Like I think that makes tons of sense. Yeah. It, yeah. it sounds as if the, this is really an attempt to say, look, we're going to go ahead and do the, the hybrid deployment uh, feature yeah. across everything. It, it's no more, well, you get a little extra if you install on-premise. Yep. It's going to work the same on-premise. It's going to work the same in That's Azure. Right. You pick what you want. Yep. I, think I, I think I've observed this on the show. Again, huge server guy. But I, I, I sort of look <laughs> at, well, I mean, I, I, uh, what's it called? The Azure Appliance, um, Azure Stack? Yeah, Azure Stack. Mm -hmm. Azure Stack. I, I, in, in many ways... That's where we're heading, isn't it? You know, like that becomes what they're on, on prem. They're not going to call it that, but their their on prem solution Version essentially becomes yeah. Azure Stack at some point. As it matures, yeah. I think mm -hmm. so. Right. So in in July, also Padre, you were asking, well, how are they making this so small? They took out all the physical features of Nano Server, <laughs> so okay. drivers, Hyper V, the Scala File oh, Server, all perfect. those things were removed. So it's basically it's bare metal now. This is this is as thin as they're going to get. Yeah. Okay. All you need it is really the is notepad nano. shell on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you can you get a container for uh, image for Notepad? Like a Notepad container and, and run like that on a, Azure. A container. <laughs> You'd be done. Uh, you could have a, a hybrid Notepad installation. That would yep. be fantastic. Wow. wow. Actually, if you ran, what you would do is you run Hyper V server on the base metal, and then you've got those two things running virtually. It's beautiful. I think we, we've got it set. We've got it solved. That's it. That's, that's, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of Windows Weekly. Uh, that's about as good as we're ever going to get. We've solved it. I've cracked this nut. Congratulations. Uh, anything else? What are the other goodies that I, I can look forward to? In server? I mean, so op great optimization. Fantastic optimization. And the, the, the unspoken part of that is also that this is really sort of the the uh, the hybrid deployment platform this this gives you the the, the yep. purest type of container yep. environment um also windows subsystem for linux is now on server so you can run uh yep. the different linux distributions on server if you would like to do that okay get your head around that right <laughs> that's interesting nice. hmm. yep. right. nano server at .net core 2.0 and notepad Done. <laughs> and IIS. We need, a, we need a name for that SKU. I don't know what it would be. The Foley SKU, perhaps? I yes. Don't know. Yep. I, I'm actually okay with that. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm looking down the rest of the updates. It's, well, yeah. uh, a lot of stability and efficiency updates. Yeah. Uh, they're doing a little bit for security and for uh, uh, resiliency, for backup. Um, mm -hmm. No Hadoop. <laughs> Nope, that's a, that's a separate matter. <laughs> no, I just had to throw that in there because people in the chat room are we saying, wait a minute, it. we haven't said Hadoop yet. No, uh, we have. Someone was waiting to drink and they needed the keyword. <laughs> Hadoop, Hadoop, Hadoop. There you go. Have a good day. Congratulations. Yeah. All right, are we done with the fall creators? Is there anything else Let's that say. we have to tap there? 
No. Uh, no, that was the big stuff. You know, the 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 skip ahead stuff and Windows 10 S being finally made available, and then of course like you know, the Windows Server. Yeah, and we've already available. spoken about how much of a mess the Windows Store is. Do we need to go in any more de detail on that? Mm -hmm. There were some people I, I in the chat room who were not convinced that it's actually a mess. Yeah, those people are insane, and I'd like to meet them personally because no, <laughs> they, uh, look, uh, no, what this story, what this story is about. I didn't write this. Actually, this is based on something Tom Warren wrote over at The Verge, which is that there are uh, malicious apps essentially in the store that let you uh, illegally download movies and do all this horrible stuff. Like this is the kind of amateur hour stuff that shouldn't be occurring in a first class app store. And this is a, a different way that the Windows Store is a mess. You know, Microsoft uh, every once in a while will, go, will do a little public show of cleaning it up. This was a problem back in the day in Windows Phone as well, um, where we had uh, applications where you could get ROMs for Nintendo games and then play them on emulators and stuff like that, completely right. illegal. And, uh, you you know, their system for it at the time was like, well, someone has to report it. And you have to do it on an app-by-app -app basis. And it's like, well, this guy just uploaded... 117 of these things. Why is this my responsibility? Mm -hmm. um, so this situation is still occurring in the Windows Store today, unfortunately. And I think it's compounded in the Windows Store because of the low volume, the low traffic. And in the other stores that we all frequent, there's such a high yeah. volume on some of these apps that you very quickly figure out which apps are good and which apps are bogus slash bundled with malware. Something yep. can stick on the Windows Store for months before someone says, <laughs> yeah. you know what, this is doing yeah. really bad things. Yeah. yeah. So, by the way, I, I'm not, I probably won't be able to pull up a good example of this off the top of my head, but one of the discussions you can kind of have around Windows 10s and whether or not it is or is not uh, acceptable. Like, if you let me see what happens when I I'll just try one as an example. You go to the store and you look for something that you want, right? Like Microsoft. Uh, uh, I typed in Microsoft Edge, like Microsoft Excel, and. Mm -hmm. You know, what comes up is not Microsoft Excel. And so actually this isn't a great example because the only thing that came up was apps. But in some cases, what you'll get is other types of content that map the thing you're searching for. And this is not, not great in the sense that none of these are probably openly, you know, terrible. But frankly, aside from the couple of Microsoft things that come up, actually you're there's, seeing more than I am. Then there's no quality here though. Look at this. But that's what I mean. And 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 yeah. I did an example, I can't remember what it was, but I had an example where I, I literally typed in something on Windows 10 S to find something and what came up was like this it was just a bunch of crap. And it's like, well, there's a high quality store experience for you right there. Like this is crazy. Mm -hmm. You visit the store once and then you go, Oh, I don't need the store. Why yeah, I need the store? I, and it's a real that's a real problem. Yeah. I was talking to um, a friend from Microsoft, and he was saying the, the, the goal of the store is to be so wonderful, to, to draw you in <laughs> so that you don't feel the need to go off to a website and download something that you install into Windows. Uh, this is nowhere well, near that yeah. at all. Not even close. <laughs> It's like they, it's, it was it like bring your kid to school or work day and they let some little kid design this. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> but you know, yeah, I, it's really I remember when I, when I had an iPad, which was a while ago, admittedly, that store wasn't the best either. I mean, it wasn't as horrible as this with, but it's hard to find apps in stores, which is crazy. Why but, can't but, it be well, easy? How long, right, so. how long did that iPad store stay bad? I mean, it, it got better yeah, very, I, very you quickly. Know what, I, how yeah. long have we had Windows Store and, this is basically I what I saw at the, the beginning. The difference, and I agree that it can be hard up, to find right? something, right? So if I if I go into right. the, this is on an iPhone, but if I type in the same search, Microsoft Excel, yeah. the, well, Microsoft Excel comes up. Um, and then you get other <laughs> Microsoft apps, Word, yeah. PowerPoint, OneNote, Outlook, OneDrive, Office Lens, Skype. I'm, I'm waiting to see, like, when does something terrible come up? Okay, it's that's all good. Microsoft. That's good. Right, so I, I'm yeah. going. It's all Microsoft. Maybe Microsoft, I should say Microsoft. the Android Store because I have more recent. I have more recent experiences well, no, no, I, with that on I, my phone. I think this point is valid because uh, they they can both be. T well, actually, what you said was yeah. it's hard to find things, and that that's correct. Uh, it, it can be it hard is. to find things. It's also correct that uh, even in the Apple Store, it didn't happen on this one, but you can do a search on the Apple Store. Uh, I'm, just, I'm making this up. You search for Spotify, but because there is an app that has paid for an ad that's a little bit like yeah. Spotify. They actually yep. come up above Spotify in the search results. That is unacceptable. Yeah. Um, and so the the iOS App Store can be it can be hard to find things because there's so much there. In the Microsoft App Store, the Windows Store, it can be hard to find thing find things because hey, that thing you want is actually not there. And what you get is this list of crap. Yeah, you know, I searched for something just, it, useful it, in tough. the in the Windows Store, and uh, this yeah, is what I got. Great. So.
Yay. <laughs> That's actually about right. Yeah, there's just, it's I mean, tough. there's nothing here. Look at this. I know. It's a ghost. I mean, look, okay, let's, let's, let's put a real search well, term. To give, be fair, give me if something I that will something find something useful in the uh, Apple store, it probably wouldn't come up with anything either. Uh, but let's yeah. word. Okay, this is a, this is a main app. Okay, well, so one note comes up, yay. Um, <laughs> and then a bunch. And, and look, even even the corollary searches. Well, I guess I could pray against addiction. Uh, this yeah. is just not. This is not enticing for me. For me as a consumer, yeah. for me the as an administrator, is, way, or for me as an author, I I'm not going to be part of this. Here, here's a little gotcha. Um, Microsoft makes an app called Word, and it's not coming up. And the reason is, <laughs> you have got it selected on available on desktop. Now select that thing. This? Next to the arrow there. Oh, no, the t it says available on desktop. Oh, okay. And select all devices. And now look what happens. You yeah. actually get Microsoft Word. You get the mobile version of Word because it's a it's a mobile app. But the fact that that doesn't come yeah. up. Um, and that's, God, a, that's like, a noob mistake. That's that's just that's something that like someone should be going through here and saying, wait a minute. Why no, aren't granted. the highest quality results showing up? Yeah, well, now they, the, keep, the, the, they the keep trying to clean it up, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's likely that the person searching wants Word, not Word Mobile. They want the full version of Word, yeah. right? Um, and in the future, that will come up, right? Because they're they are centennializing it or whatever. Um, but man, I, can, are you telling me there isn't some presentation you could bring up uh, to download the desktop version of Off mm -hmm. you know, Word or whatever other mm -hmm. Office apps? Go to Office365.com or whatever it is. Um, yep. It's just so second rate. That's their application. I know. You know, it's tough. So there is there is also a separate we, store if you're business customers. Like you you have the Microsoft store for business. And right. I have not checked how the results rank there, but hopefully they're better. Well, I mean, um, they, they've got the Candy Crush app. So this is, <laughs> this is pretty good, I think, right? I couldn't find words, so I spent the day playing Candy Crush. <laughs> I hope you understand. <laughs> this, this, I mean, you know, uh, the, the Windows Store does have a decent version of Candy Crush. That's How much a, do you have to hate yourself to stare at this screen all day long? Uh, a lot. A lot. Jeez, that is terrible. <laughs> but I mean, I finally, I, I, I'm using the touch screen on my laptop, so this is this is a good thing, right? <laughs> and, then, and then I go, no, let's get back to work. There you go. Oh. Well, that's tough. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, and I, I don't know a way forward. There's people in the chat room who are saying, look, you just blow up the store and start over. But that's not really a feasible option either. Yeah. You know, uh, there's, there are different. it's funny. Microsoft has approached stores from different angles. If you look at the way they've done it on Xbox, it was a highly, highly curated experience for so long. And you had to be a tier A developer. You had to throw what you wanted to do by Microsoft before you even did it. They would say yes or no before they even saw it. You would develop the game or later an app. You'd give it to Microsoft. They would say, no, here's why. It's going gonna, it's gonna to meet all these requirements. And then the thing that would get out into the store would actually be of high quality. Um, they just opened up the Xbox store to individual developers who want to write apps and games. And as you might expect, they're largely amateurish. But they're, they're off in their own little kind of corner of the store and whatever. The Windows store is so bad that that same program on Windows, because it is literally the same program, those apps are just interspersed throughout the store because they're just as good or bad as the other apps. There is no difference. And that kind of shows you where those two things are at. You know, you start with super high quality and you, then you allow in the, the whole world. And you start at the point where you're like, we're just going to grow this thing. We're going to allow the whole world in. And well, that's what you get. You get the whole world. Um, you get a guy yeah. who wrote a really simplistic app to, uh, because he loves some celebrity. And then he rewrites it for every celebrity that's ever been known to man. Yeah, it's just terrible. Okay, let's go to something that's not terrible. We need to give our <laughs> listeners something that they can attach to and say, this is, this is good, this is positive. And what's positive exactly. is a exactly. new chip. We've got a brand oh. new chip from Intel, 8th gen. Uh, and, and Paul, it's, nailed it. it's good, right? They nailed it totally? No. No. Okay. I, I'm never going to be able to explain this adequately, <laughs> but I guess what I'll say is when Intel released the 6th gen Skylake chips, the 7th gen Cabby Lake chips, they were of a generation in the sense that they were, you know, uh, ultra mobile chips, mobile chips, desktop chips, quad core chips, dual core chips, whatever they were. They were of the same generation. <coughs> For this generation, uh, because its customers, meaning PC makers, expect a new release every year and they are not ready with their latest talk. I think this is the 17th talk release. Okay, I'm losing track. Um, 
they they are calling three different things, three literally completely different generations of chips, eighth generation core processors. Oh no! And this is the, <laughs> I mean, listen, you've heard me on just the show complain about a bunch of Microsoft stuff. This is easily the dumbest thing I've heard of this week, easily. And uh, I know they're going to change this because it, in the in the future, when they get to the third of those three things, they're going to give it a different name because why would you want it associated with this piece of junk? But anyway, uh, Cabby Lake, it's been around since this time last year. Uh, they, well, actually, they didn't really finalize it, but by January of this past year, they basically rolled out the entire lineup. They actually expanded it with some new extreme chips and so forth. And now what they have is a new genera. It's <laughs> a, it is a, how they call it? Um, it's a refresh of the mm -hmm. U series chips, which have are for ultra mobile devices like Ultrabooks, which historically have been uh, dual core chips. Well, now they're they're quad core chips, so the performance is better, as you would expect. So they're going to call that eighth generation, even though it uses the seventh generation design, just added cores. Um, sometime in the next year, they're going to release. Uh, see if I get this one right. Cannon Lake? Yeah, Cannon Lake. This is a 14 nanometer. It's the, yet another talk, the 129th talk since Skylake. I can't remember anymore. Actually, Skylake was a talk too since Broadwell. doesn't matter. The point is there's going to be a next generation 14 nanometer design that they will also call 8th generation. <laughs> <laughs> and then a year after that, they're going to finally go to 10 nanometers. Maybe no, no, that that's when Cannon, Cannon Lake is, isn't no, it? That's Cannon Coffee Lake, Lake is that's 10. That's Coffee Lake. Coffee Lake. Yeah. They're going to call oh. that, get, wait for it, eighth generation Intel Core high process. <laughs> this is so self inflicted confusion. This is so ridiculous. Yikes. Now you have to have that, that confusing conversation with, oh, it's eighth yeah. gen. With a, which eighth gen? With an asterisk. <laughs> Listen, I, I guarantee that, I guarantee by the time they go to 10 nanometers, they are not going to call that the same thing. You're going to want to call that out. <laughs> that, that is a new generation. I, mm. However, you choose to define these things. Uh, other than the fact that they might want to brush under the carpet the fact that they're about five years behind ARM when it comes to this uh, type of technology. But, jeez, like, yeah, just, woof, tough. It's really <laughs> bad. <laughs> they didn't even mention Ice Lake, right? Like, nope. which Ice they Lake teased yeah. before, right? And nope. we talked about last week, right, which right, is also right. a 10 what nanometer like, chip. Ice Lake? Also 10, 10. 10 so nanometer. maybe it's the one after that. Is that Ice what Lake's that is? after after Cannon Lake, we thought. Okay. Yep. These guys are unbelievable. They make <laughs> me feel so much better about Microsoft. <laughs> you know, because I, I sit, I, I, I'm sort of um, treading water in this Microsoft swamp, and mm -hmm. and then Intel does this thing over there, and and now I feel better about my situation. <laughs> it, it really yeah. does. It does seem. It seems. I'm not sure if this is because they're they're scared of amd amd has been making some serious strides recently and they, that's right they want to have the appearance that they're pushing out new technology faster but yep. this that's is what I think not it. it this because eventually they, but they're yeah. they're shooting themselves in their future foot right in other words yeah this year they're not ready for that annual release so they're going to pretend that this previous gen thing is the next gen okay that's fine but when the next gen actually arrives you call that one the ninth generation you right. don't you don't lump the next three gen, or well, the next two and a half generations, whatever you want to call it, into one thing because mm -hmm. when it's 2019 or whenever it is that Cannon Lake or whatever it is, the 10 nanometer version appears, you, you're not going to want to associate with something that came out two years ago. You, 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 this is new. Mm -hmm. This is legitimately new. Right. Um, so yeah, I think the issue. You remember last year? I think it was early last year. Intel revealed uh, first in a, I think it was a 10Q filing or whatever that. Uh, they were slowing down their development process. So they weren't going to do tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Um, I think right now, literally, they're on tick tock, 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 <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Tickety tick. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to keep track. Like I said, but you know, okay, fine. Like, look, it's not. It's not just because Intel is a slow-moving behemoth and whatever. It's not just because the world is changing and we're you know computers aren't the big thing anymore. It's not just because. There are these competitors that are moving faster than Intel, and maybe that helps make Intel look bad by comparison. You know, whatever. But I, I think the thing is, it's August, and if they didn't release something that they said was new, 
You know, their stock would plummet. Intel doesn't release new chips. So they're, they're falling behind yet again. I mean, just last year, they said they were slowing down. They've slowed down yet again. Literally, well, I think, if you look I at think their- the reason the reason they went mobile first, right, is because of what's about to happen with with um, ARM, right? That's right. That's right. Well, we, that's what we talked about last week. Remember, everyone, yeah. even Microsoft did it. You know, they make it seem like what are these things called? Always on PCs, right? Yeah. Always on PCs are not just ARM. Right. But it seems like they are. You mm -hmm. know, Intel's over in the corner going, guys, hello, we're making those too. We've been around right. for a while. We know yeah. how to make yeah. these chips. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, Intel, did they did pull back mightily from embedded. Mm -hmm. They were really trying to get into that makerspace. They wanted to be the preferred chips sure. source for embedded devices. And right. they basically, yeah, we're not making any headway. And they yanked that. I, I think they might be reeling from I think realizing so that there's just parts of these markets that they cannot compete in. I, I, Intel is very much like Microsoft in this way. I think that um, there are people who are, you know, kind of Windows fans who have a hard time accepting that that world I described earlier has has moved on and, and a lot mobile devices and all that kind of stuff. Um, Intel has embraced it, though, publicly, just like Microsoft has. They, look, you know, the majority of our revenues going forward are going to come from servers that will be in cloud facilities. And, um, you know, we're still going to make PC chips, just like Microsoft is still going to make PC OSs. It's not necessarily the focus anymore. But that's sort of why I feel like they could have just called this what it was. And it would have mm -hmm. been fine. By the way, Cabby Lake, unlike Sky Lake, arrived with no drama whatsoever. Right. So here we are a year later, and they're like, guys, we're going to refresh Cabby Lake. We're going to put quad cores and everything. I think the whole world would have, oh, the world that cares about this stuff, would have actually applauded that. And if you just name it what it is, no one would have complained. Um, no one that matters, you know, no one that actually mm -hmm. cares about this stuff. There was somebody in the marketing department who said, hey, you know what was great? When we had all that drama, we should do some drama yeah. again. I bet that person was the same person who said, I have an idea. Let's call Windows <laughs> NT Windows 2000 and we'll say it's powered by NT technology. Oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. I'll never forget that. Or, by the way, forgive mm -hmm. it. Well, okay, I, I do want to move on to something that's very, very important, something that, that Mary Jo Foley has near and dear to her heart. Yes. And we could not do a Windows Weekly without, and that is gaming. Mary Jo, I know that you are a big gamer. Uh, right after that. this, right after the show, you're going to be dro dropping uh, on, what do they call it, <laughs> online? We're going to hop into a multiplayer deathmatch and that Call thing? of Duty. You're going to do that thing? Uh, yeah. And take sure. there's new hardware for you to do it on. Project Scorpio is alive. That's right. Tell me about yep. it. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to I make know, this brief. So here's what I know. There's a, there were some gaming consoles shown off. There was a Minecraft one. There was a black one that had some bumps on it. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. This no, is no, the no, best no, gaming no roundup Patrick. ever. <laughs> Nailed it. The end. <laughs> All right. All right. Oh, so, Paul, it is exciting. It actually is exciting. I it's, think so. Yes. Okay. So Microsoft has opened up pre-orders for the Xbox One X. Um, but the pre-orders for, are for, for a special edition of the console. Like you said, it has, uh, I'd say, black black with bumps. Black with bumps. <laughs> um, yeah. It has Project Scorpio branding, which I think the fans really like. The box looks like one of the original Xboxes, which is pointless, but it, it's still kind of cool. Um, and it's what it is really is the day one edition. Like when the original Xbox One came out in 2013, I think it was, um, when you pre-ordered it, you got the Xbox One day one edition. This is the Xbox One X version of that. Um, the Xbox One S, remember, had a, a special two terabyte version, which was available for pre-order. You can no longer get. Um, same thing. So it's basically already pretty much sold out. Um, obviously, if you want an, a new Xbox One X in November, you can get one, but you're just not going to get the special edition of the console. But you get the same thing. It's 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 the same capabilities, the same ports, the same controller. You know, you just don't get the special branding on it. So it's just a special version of that. So it looks like the original Xbox. Mm -hmm. Oh, I haven't had an Xbox since the one. I, I kind of, I've skipped, I've fallen off really. Is this something for me to get into? Oh, dear God, yes. So, yeah, I, the, the, the comments I've been hearing on the net as have been mostly from fanboys who are disappointed mm -hmm. that this is not the the Jesus Kuhn uh, version of the Xbox, that this will destroy all. I, the that hardware it is, looks incredible. People are unbelievers who must be destroyed. <laughs> um, I, 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 I think that... Look, you know, obviously a console is never going to match like a high-end gaming PC from a pure specs perspective. There's no way around that. But w when we look at something like 1080p to true 4K resolution, 60 frames a second for most games, 
uh, outperforming the PlayStation Pro, which I think is job one. You know, it, it reestablishes Microsoft as the market leader for this type of product. And I think that's super important because, you know, they've fallen behind in this generation and probably are never going to recover. Um, but Microsoft's Xbox strategy is much bigger than a single console. They have other versions of the console, Xbox One S, which still does 4K for video, HDR capabilities, and so forth. It's, it's super affordable now, too, which is great. And it runs all the Xbox games. And so you've got this nice kind of, you know, way you can move up in the world if you later move to an Xbox One X, you get additional capabilities in all, well, not all of them, but in a lot of the games you already own because they'll be upsized or whatever. Um, they announced uh, new console bundles for Xbox One X. The Minecraft one in particular was kind of cool looking. Um, they they didn't, I, I don't think they newly announced any new games, but they showed off some games for the first time or, or in more depth than they had before. Um, and, they, you know, they're kind of setting themselves up for the holiday season. So I, I think this console is awesome. I can't wait to get this. Mm -hmm. are we are we're done with generation wars, right? I mean, it's it, we're we're not doing that whole I, thing where we wait ten years and then we get a new generation console. It's right. And Microsoft and Sony have both yeah. come to the same conclusion that this is unsustainable. I actually, there are business reasons why this probably won't happen. But I was just looking at an HP Omen X gaming laptop they announced this week. It looks awesome. One of the things that they're doing with this device is. Uh, allowing for user serviceable parts in a very easy way. This is panel pops off. You can take out the RAM. You can overclock RAM. You can put new storage in, whatever you want to do. Um, you could almost make the case for doing that in consoles. You know, that if you accept the fact that a console is no longer a single generation per se, but we're going to say the Xbox One family of products, it is something that scales from some hardware type to some hardware type. Just like mobile devices do, really, when you think um, about it, like an app developer on iOS or whatever will make a version of the app that runs a certain way on an iPhone 5, but if you have a bigger screen device with higher resolution or a tablet, it can scale to those things. I mean, this is a way to protect your software library across devices. It's more important to Microsoft and Sony to sell a console than it is for you to keep that one console and then buy games for a while. Um, they make, you know, this is a way for them to enhance their own. Uh, the, I should say the platform's viability as well. As well, so I, I love this direction, and I, we didn't really mention this, but the the cross play capabilities as well that Microsoft has. It's kind of unique right now. It's not again not every game, but um, you can play against people in some games who are on different uh, platforms like Minecraft. You can buy a game on Xbox or at Windows 10 and play it on the other as well, including saving your progress through a game. And so you might be playing on the way home from work on a tablet because you're on a, a train or whatever. Get home, pop it up on the big screen with your Xbox, and you're back in the same exact game with a higher fidelity experience. It scales, you know. I think that stuff's super important. And there are these kind of old-fashioned console guys who don't get that still, and I, I'm just not on board with it. And, and you know, the, in honor of Mary Jo Foley, this is actually a very noticeable <laughs> part of the Microsoft service and services future yep. strategy yep. Uh, it is it's another actually. screen it's yep. a very important screen right uh, and, right. and micro this is one of those few advantages microsoft has against players like google or apple mm -hmm. and and all uh where they yep. can say no we've we've got not just a competent not just a good but really an industry leading depending on how you measure it device that will give us entry into the screen um mm -hmm. right that's and yes I'll, I'll take that yeah, plus the services part, right? Oh, yes. Obviously, I mean, that's really where every earnings call you hear Microsoft talk about how many more Xbox Live users they have. I mean, that's what that's where they're going to make their money, right? I mean, consoles, yeah, they're they're there for sure, oh, yes. but but well, services. Well, by the way, what's what's Apple's yeah. second big like biggest growing business? Gaming, right? Now? right? It's well, uh, it's services. I mean, right? apps, yeah. Because yeah. you have this body of customers who are just. Have got your stuff, and yeah. now they're buying other stuff, and that that could be right. true on the console as well. And gaming you know? is the biggest category of mobile apps, um, still. Yes, I believe. Yeah, yeah, by far. Yeah. Yep. yep. As it should be. By far. <laughs> <laughs> now let's move on. Gig Jam. Candy we crush. hardly oh. knew ye. I am crushed. I this was an application I thought was going to rule the desktop on the enterprise for decades to come. Gig Jam <laughs> is no more. <laughs> Yeah, Gig Jam, you know, it was one of those apps had a very odd name and trying to describe it in just a few words was next to impossible. Um, so this is this was an app. Uh, it was actually a collection of lightweight apps plus a service that Microsoft was trying to position as a new way for companies 
um, to securely collaborate. So say you were, say you had a um, price sheet that you wanted to share with somebody who was your partner, but you didn't want them to see the pricing part of it from another partner. You could kind of selectively cut out what they could see and yet still share the document with them. So it, it had some interesting ideas and applications. And when Microsoft first showed this off at the partner show in 2015, I remember I was kind of like, I wonder what, what the audience is going to think. And they loved it. They were like applauding it. I'm like, oh, they actually get this. Like they think this is going to be super cool. So it went through preview. It went through a public preview. Microsoft added support for iOS. I think they had Android support. And yesterday they said, you know what? We decided we're not going to bring this to market after all. So it's uh, going to be closed. The gig jam service is going to be closed next month in September, September 22nd. If you have any gigs, as those um, collections of collaborative work are called, they are going to be phased out. So make sure to get your gigs out of gig jam before it <laughs> get your gigs turns on jam. To jam. <laughs> <laughs> it, it always felt like this was something that could be incorporated into OneNote. Uh, it, it's, mm. you know, this this whole idea of circle what you need, cross out uh -huh. what you don't. Very mm. fringe feature, very uh -huh. useful if you actually ever used it uh, because there's yeah. nothing like it. And I think that's what got people so excited, which is we've never seen anything like this. Yeah. And I'm sure yep. someone at Microsoft said, okay, cool feature, but a feature mm. is not a product. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, they they keep trying to figure out how to make work how to make people's work lives better and how to make people more productive at work. That's a big focus for Microsoft right now. Mm -hmm. So you see things, anything involving workflows, they're trying to do a lot of experimentation around that. And as, as several people said on Twitter yesterday, hey, at least they tried it and it didn't work. They didn't bring it to market and then kill it, which would have been worse. And they also did say that some of the um, technologies and learnings that they had from Gig Jam may show up in other products at some point. Here's my prediction. You're going to see Gig Jam's feature back, but it is only an edge. In OneNote. <laughs> only an edge. You <laughs> have to have the photo to app, and then they'll rename the photo app to Gig Jam. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, all right. From, from Gig Jam dying to a partnership <laughs> blossoming, we're going to be seeing more of uh, Microsoft and Red Hat's partnership. Mary Jo Foley, what's yeah. that going to look like and why? Yeah, so... Um, Again, a couple of years ago, everybody was wondering why Microsoft had not done a deal with Red Hat because they had all these different Linux distributions available in their cloud um, from all the other big Linux vendors, basically, except Red Hat. And finally, they did do the deal and they both had some very stringent patent terms and they signed the deal and they got Red Hat Linux on Azure. Well, since then, uh, Microsoft and Red Hat have been collaborating more. So you saw yesterday Red Hat saying, hey, we're going to be using .NET Core 2 in all of our products. And they also said that together they'd be making native support for Windows Server containers on Red Hat's OpenShift container platform come to market next year. Uh, there also will be support for Windows Server containers on Red Hat OpenShift dedicated on Azure and that you will also see SQL Server on OpenShift. So OpenShift is Red Hat's contain container application platform. So you're seeing now Microsoft and Red Hat go, okay, we, we've got the basic partnership down in the cloud. What else can we do together? And we know Microsoft's got SQL Server 2017 coming out this year. It's going to work on Windows and Linux. So you, you we already know that Red Hat's going to be one of those flavors where it will work. And I, I predict you will see more and more kind of uh, deals coming forward between the two companies as they figure out other places where they might be able to collaborate. And, you know, if we, we talk about the new Microsoft on the show a lot, um, Microsoft and Red Hat working together, I think a lot of people just maybe four years ago would have said, nope, never going to happen. And right. here we are. <laughs> yeah, so, no, yeah. Th this is absolutely the, the embodiment of the services strategy because it is. Microsoft's looking at this and saying, hey, look, we can either stick with putting anything that we put out only on server or yep. we can make a lot of money doing SQL on Red Hat. What do you want? Yep. And, and a lot of, yeah. you know, it's aimed at Oracle. SQL on Linux is aimed at Oracle, right? right. <laughs> because so many Microsoft customers were like, yeah, that's great. You get SQL server on Windows. That's great. But I'm stuck over here with Oracle running on Linux. Microsoft, can you help out? <laughs> 
So I think a lot of people are super excited to see that come to market, especially people who already are running SQL Server on Windows. They're like, oh, wow, now I could have SQL Server also on Linux that have the same version on both. Uh, an open question here. Do you think there's a path backwards? I, I absolutely see mm -hmm. people saying, oh, yeah, I'd love to run SQL on, on Linux. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. My data mm -hmm. center is already Linux. My colo is already Linux. My containers yep. are Linux. That, great. Yep. Would there become a point at which someone says, it runs really well on Linux, it might mm. even run better on Windows Server. Why don't I go Trojan ahead and horse. give that a try? <laughs> Maybe. You I mean, what? that's Microsoft would love that. Right? <laughs> if that's Microsoft's strategy, that is the greatest thing I've ever heard of in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. they make a couple of tweaks to SQL, and it still works It'll on Linux. Amazing. It's just it's faster on Windows Server for some yep. reason. Get a bunch of people suckered in and like, actually... If you want this failover feature or whatever, <laughs> you got to be on Windows, which, by the way, has low cost licensing. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. <laughs> well, I don't know if you guys remember when they first said they were bringing SQL Server to Linux. At first, we all thought, oh, yeah, it's going to be some like Namby little subset of thought. SQL Server. That's what I thought. Nope. It's, it's not. Full. It's the full version. <laughs> it's, like, right, right. it's the full version. Not, not every single feature that's on Windows, but like that's the goal. And that, again, <clears throat> The new Microsoft? Yeah. <laughs> yeah if, you if think you, you could write articles in the T-SQL editor that comes with um, SQL Server for Linux? Um, on the Nano yes, Server the, implementation? On Nano Server, that you yes, were yes. About? Yeah. On a virtual Nano Server yeah. implementation. <laughs> Pretty much a bunch of nonsense words yeah. right there. I know what T-SQL is in theory, but uh, I think it's I think <laughs> well, it's. Well, you don't have to write T-SQL. You just have to use the editor. <laughs> okay. oh, wait, but, but, but wait. <laughs> using, using Red Hat Linux, can I, can I run... Notepad in a container because then that's what I really Ooh. want. Oh, of course, Ooh. of course you can. I bet there are a multitude of ways in which you could virtualize Notepad and/or the environment in which it went, runs. I, I <laughs> might just do that for fun. How many how many places can I run Notepad? Just bring up like a virtual <laughs> instance of Notepad on every OS that you, you wow. can imagine. That would almost be wow. worth doing. I, I'll make a calendar of screenshots <laughs> of Notepad running in different environments. <laughs> Oh, this is why I shouldn't be allowed to touch broadcasts. <laughs> <clears throat> he's like, he's like, know how, hmm, know, an episode. I, I actually, I, I have been going through, I'm like, yes. well, I know at least five I can do. So where else can I run Notepad? <laughs> I, see, I, my mind is more like, it's malicious, but it's funny. I think I'm going to do it. <laughs> just because you can, right? Yeah. You just got to find, find a little uh, free time there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that, mm -hmm. that's abundant. Uh, one, yeah. one last bit, and actually, I'm, I'm kind of excited about this. Uh, bringing AI to Azure using uh, what was it, FPGAs? So I'm going to yeah. be using Gate Arrays with a yep. new product or new feature that Microsoft's coming out with that gives me some smarts. Mary Jo, what's that about? Yeah, so this is this actually is pretty interesting, and I stumbled onto this a few weeks ago when I I was looking through the Microsoft Research Faculty Summit session list as I often do. And I saw this name Brainwave and then suddenly it disappeared from the session list. And I'm like, oh, they're doing something with Brainwave. So what is Brainwave? So if you think about what Microsoft's talked about, they their idea is they already use field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs inside their own data centers. What, it, hey, what if we could let that other developers outside the company use FPGAs on Azure? Like what if we could give them access to that capability? So what kind of workloads might they want to run? Maybe AI stuff, because you need super high-end processing power for that. So that's what Brainwave is. Brainwave is bringing a deep neural networking framework, put it on top of these FPGAs in Azure, and then ultimately making it available to customers. So it's almost like here's how Microsoft makes Azure an AI cloud. Kind of crazy if you think about it. And, and you know, before you think, oh, yeah, someday, right? Next year, like next calendar year is when we think they're going to have FPGAs be available to out external developers on Azure. Brainwave probably sometime shortly after that or even at the same time. Now, the, where my mind first went when I read this story was just last week, Microsoft basically announced that they've nailed context speech recognition. Yep. So they, mm -hmm. they've, they've got that down. The yep. one part they don't have for a real quote unquote, universal translator is idiom recognition. That's that's mm. a little trickier. I, I mm -hmm. may know what word you said. I don't know what it means if you're using an idiom. Yeah. Deep learning can actually do that. You can actually right. have a deep learning FPGA start to yeah. figure out 
what combination of words becomes idioms and how those idioms translate into other idioms. Right. I, I would love to see it, that. Because you train it, right? Yes, Yeah, you train, you train the model. And so then it starts getting smarter. And to do that, you have to have a ton of processing power. That's what this is all about, right? They're, they're saying most companies, in fact, almost no companies would ever have that much processing power available in their own data centers. So they're trying to make it available to them through Azure and give them another reason to try Azure. Do you buy it, Paul? Are we going to get AI smart? I just heard idioms and I kind of drifted off. <laughs> He's like FPGAs, DNN. Like all <laughs> no, I was words. good with all that. It was the idiom thing. It's like, me with, it's like me with the bumpy black console, right? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was an incredibly accurate way to describe it. Uh, I, What's the advantage know, of this over a normal Xbox One X? It's uh, bumpy. It's, bu it's bumpy. It's bumpy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's let's de geek a little bit now. The, the end of the show, I always get a little bit confused because I'm not sure exactly where the the, the questions are supposed to come from. Do we have uh, listener Q and A? We pluck them out of the air. Are we? Are we plucking? Yeah, sometimes this we episode? don't have it. Yeah, sometimes we do. Sometimes we don't. Like I think this week we probably don't. <laughs> well, in that case, I, let's go to my favorite part, which are the tips and picks. We've got a couple of here. The app of the week. Now, <laughs> I smiled when I saw this because I, I wasn't sure if it was a joke. And then I read it and I said, okay, I can see this. Newton for Windows? Not Newton, the Apple PDA device, <laughs> but <laughs> Newton, the email application, which has actually been around for a few years now on iOS and Android, and I think on the Mac as well. And they finally ported it to Windows 10. But I'm, I'm actually interested in, in this for a couple of reasons. Um, one it's a store app, and you know, as we've been saying for most of the show, we have a, 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 we don't have a lot of really high quality store apps, and this is a high quality store app. This is actually a really nice one. Um, it's professional. It's got nice uh, command density. It's got a nice UI. It's it's pretty neat looking and professional. Um, the only issue is that you have to pay for it, which isn't actually a huge issue. You have to pay for it every single year, so it's fifty dollars a year. And Ooh. if it was fifty dollars. I would probably be using this full time right now. Yeah, but fifty dollars um, a year. Fifty dollars a year is tough. That's a little. But tough. I, the reason I, I I did pick this is because I'm going to hold this up as an example of a great looking UWP app. It has the kind of uh, minimalist approach that I see in things like Google Inbox, available in Windows 10, and it, you know that's huge for me. So I think this thing looks great. It's just too expensive. Is it actually in the Windows Store? Yes. It yes. Is. Oh, how about that? Look at that. <laughs> yep. You found it on your first try. I nice. Well, I had the link, so <laughs> that was kind of I was cheating yeah, a little it's, bit. It really is a great app. I, I would love to use it, but I, I just can't justify paying every year for something like this. So, what would, um, what but, would be the value add for someone like me who is very simplistic on email? I'm still using Outlook 2007. So, I actually use Google Inbox on the desktop in web app form, right? And with Google Chrome, you can make it run like kind of a pseudo local app, which I like. Um, on mobile, I also use Google Inbox. And so what you get is the same UI, so you get that kind of consistency of UI. Um, when you do pay for Newton Mail, you get it across all the platforms it supports. So if you use an iPhone or an Android device, you can actually use the same exact email client on your phone as well. And I think there's some benefit to simplicity and consistency, especially when it's something that works really, really well. Um, I already get that with Inbox. Um, you know, obviously, this thing would support offline and so forth. But uh, honestly, until and unless they kind of come down on the price, it's kind of a tough one. I just wanted to people to see this because I, I do complain about Windows Store a lot because I think it deserves it. But here's an example of something that shows maybe there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, I get that. Actually, that's that's fantastic. It's not just that Paul Therod doesn't like the Windows Store. He's now shown right. you what he would like one to app. see in the Windows Store. <laughs> yep. Nice. Yep. In one other app. words, something that does something useful. Yeah, it's, it's not maybe as good as some of the fart apps that we have, but it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> oh, well, Alex has actually found... This is a this is a real world example of Newton in, in action. Yeah. This is how the app actually works. <laughs> These people live in your your Windows box. So, <laughs> you know, I I had one of those. I wish I had yeah. kept it. I always wanted one, and then they came out with the eMate, which was like that little laptop, and I really oh, wanted right. one of those. I've always been fascinated by super thin, you no, know, small. Laptop-like things like the Libretto or those Windows CE devices that were like a half-height screen I had, with uh, a full-size key. The HP Jornada. Yeah. That I've thing, I, loved that really, thing. I loved that thing. That was a great <laughs> I device. I use something like that forever. Uh, the problem is I have Gorilla Fingers, so I can't really type on these tiny, tiny devices. 
Yeah. But I always, always like the idea of something like the that. The problem with this commercial is the fact that they're showing these people doing something useful on the Newton. <laughs> yes. Which was also, a big it's black drawback. and white for some reason, as if it came from old timey times. I know, right? <laughs> Strange. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> Well, actually, I, I do wearing like wearing a hat, smoking. You know, <laughs> it's like from the 1940s. <laughs> With the, those hairstyles, by the way, fantastic. Yeah. We don't do that anymore. Mary Jo Foley, of course, you look fabulous. So that's that's a good thing. Oh, thanks. <laughs> but the second app is something that I think I I would use. What's yes. Office Lens for Android? So this is an app that it just it's it's been one of my kind of long term go to recommendations for mobile apps. It's been avail it's available on every mobile platform. Um, it's it's a way to scan in things using the the camera on your phone and whatever you know. There are different apps that do this, but this integrates with uh, OneNote in particular, but also with OneDrive, and uh, is very useful. But it has different modes. You can scan you know receipts and business cards. You can scan whiteboards. You can uh, scan documents. But the thing they just added to the Android version of this app only, is the ability to do multi-document scanning. What that means is that you have a, um, you know, like a multi-page document, and you take a picture of each page, and it combines it into a single document that could be Word format, it could be PDF, I think it could be some other uh, file types as well, and just saves it as a one thing. Um, obviously, this is going to come to iOS, but if you are using iOS and you want to do this right now, um, Office Lens functionality also happens to be built into the OneDrive app. And so... You could do this multi-page document scanning in iOS in the OneDrive app for now. Um, I kind of like the standalone app uh, approach, but if you want to, you know, if you know you're going to save it to OneDrive, um, you can do it right from OneDrive as well. Super useful. I tried this a few nights ago, and uh, the de-skewing works phenomenally well. Yeah, I did not deep. expect that. Right. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm used to having to go straight on in order to get. Yeah, you kind of want to right position it exactly over it. Yeah, no, you can take it at an angle. Yeah, and it just it straightens it right out. It's really good. Very good technology. Well, one more, and let's you know what, uh, just for fun, why don't we make it an app that we all know and love ish, um, <laughs> that uh, reminds us of a simpler time, maybe bring us right. back to Windows XP. So it, we we <laughs> we had the list of uh, Mary Jo's favorite things in this episode: conversation view. Um, Focused inbox, Focused and then inbox. number three, Skype mobile. Um, and oh. because of the squiggles <laughs> and the animations and the emojis and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> just, <laughs> yep, Sprinkles. that was the perfect, that was the exact right groan. Um, <laughs> when you think about that app, uh, which by the way, I'm actually okay with. I, I, I agree some of the animation stuff could be toned down, but I kind of like the, the black on white uh, UI. It's kind of a professional look as far, you know, to me. Um, mm -hmm. There's now a dark uh, theme working its way through the mobile clients. Um, Microsoft is, you know, of course, when you see that app on mobile, you think, wait a minute, there's a UWP Skype app built into Windows 10. They're going to bring this piece of junk to Windows 10, aren't they? And the answer is, yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> but what's goofy is... They actually brought it first to older versions of Windows, so yeah. Windows 7, Windows 8, and older versions of Windows 10, meaning anniversary update or older. So this thing's actually a desktop app, um, which I don't. I have to admit I wasn't 100% expecting them to actually bother to make a new version of it. Um, so I can only conclude in the creators update or maybe the fall creators update and newer, they're going to provide this UI in the UWP version going forward. It's not there now. Um, anyway, as you can see from looking at the screenshot, it's not completely objectionable. In fact, the only thing I really don't like about the UWP app on Windows, and then, of course, this app by extension, is that it's a single window interface. Um, I like having my yes. uh, chat list or you know contact mm -hmm. list in a, in a window, and then if Mary Jo types something, it pops up in its own window, and then if Brad types something, it pops up in its own window. I, I like that kind of alt-tab thing where I can go from window to window. Um, I find switching between conversations in one window to be kind of tedious. Oh, no, I, I kind of, but, I prefer it when more and more pop-ups just start crowding out mm -hmm. the main part of the screen. Mm -hmm. That's that's actually the preferred <laughs> UI. <laughs> yes, you, you mentioned that earlier. Uh, if they could just add um, some but, toolbars. You, you know, you know. Uh, but we don't know if a desktop version of Skype will come to Fall Creators Update ever, right? We don't right. know right. at this point. Well, I, look, I mean, someone's going to figure this out, but in fact, I'm surprised Raphael hasn't already released a patch that makes this work. Um, yeah, I think they're going to use this as a dividing line to force people onto the UWP version of Skype on, on yeah. newer versions of Windows 10. And Same. honestly, if they do this right, and by right, I mean completely wrong, 
but right for them. You know, the desktop version of the app won't have any additional functionality, mm. you know, like it does today. So if you look at Skype today compared to the UWP app, it's got all this extra stuff in it that's not available in UWP and probably never will be. Um, I bet this new client, which I've not seen yet, they released it, I think, right when I was traveling last week or whatever yeah. it was. Um, so I didn't have any older computers to test it on. I bet it's as limited as the UWP version. Like, I bet it, it, it mm. also cuts out all those features. And so this might be a way for them to cut some of the cruft out of Skype, uh, make all of the clients more consistent, not just visually, but functionally. And if it, if it comes down to it, it because, I, I, by the way, I, again, I've been dumping on the Windows Store, but the truth is, confronted by the same exact app, Windows Store or not Windows app, if they're functionally and visually identical, I'll always choose the Windows Store version. So Adobe Photoshop Elements is an example of that. Um, I, I will always install that version now because it's got all the great licensing and multi-PC use and so forth. It's great. There's no reason not to. Um, so I think that's how they're going to do it. But I mean, they can't really increase the feature set over the desktop version. So what they'd have to do is start taking functionality away from that's the desktop I mean. version. Yeah, in other words, only this new desktop yeah. app is how they're going to do it. It, yeah. I, I, it literally is there to take away stuff and pre present this happy new UI. You know? uh, that's, I, that's my guess. I haven't seen it yet, so I, maybe I shouldn't be so judgy about it. But that's no, how I perceive I, it. I think you can be as judgy as you'd like to be. That's I do have a rich history of <laughs> being judgy. Uh, decades <laughs> All right, let's let's move on to something that's really serious. That's enterprise pick of the week, <laughs> not this consumer app stuff. Yeah, yeah forget that. So uh, enterprise pick of the week is Microsoft Dynamics 365 for marketing. So Dynamics 365, if anyone needs a refresher, is Microsoft's new ERP and CRM suite that they started rolling out over a year ago. Um, the One of the pieces that have been missing from this is this app called Dynamics 365 for marketing. So if you're an enterprise, a larger company, Microsoft has been telling you, if you need marketing, you should use Adobe marketing because this is, again, like the Red Hat deal, one of the partnerships that they've been championing under Satya Nadella. So if you're big, go with Adobe marketing and don't worry about it. If you're small, the promise has been that Microsoft would build its own marketing app for SMB customers and make it part of Dynamics 365 for business. Well, Time has gone by and that app has not materialized, but Microsoft did say they would be discontinuing the app that they already have for marketing called Microsoft Dynamics Marketing. They said, yep, that's done. We're not selling any more licenses of that. And we didn't really know what that meant. Okay, so they've stopped selling it, but what comes next and when? So now as of this week, we do know. We know that Microsoft Dynamics Marketing, the one they're phasing out, is going to be completely phased out by next May, May 2018. We also now know that Dynamics 365 for marketing is coming in the spring of calendar 2018. They did a blog post saying that. The preview for this new app is not yet out. The sign-up page is there, so it's probably going to be out imminently for customers who want to kick the tires. Um but it's, it's a little bit complicated in the interim because they're not selling Dynamics 365 for marketing anymore. So if you're an SMB customer, they're saying, you know what, go check out some third-party offerings if you really can't wait or get into the preview, try this new thing coming. Um, and you're kind of in this weird limbo state at the moment. But at least there is a plan and now we have a better sense of what the plan is for Dynamics 365 for marketing. So that's the enterprise pick. And if you, if you look at the feature set here, it's... It's interesting because, of course, they've got the LinkedIn channel on 365, there, so they're, mm -hmm. they're they're pushing that integration, and along yep. with LinkedIn is the webinar, which is which is you know part of the whole. We want you in our uh, in our corral yep. for all yep. your training <laughs> and, and your customer uh, events, and they've uh, they've also include, in, included customer insights, which and I should I should mention that uh, my co-host on Twiat, Lou Maresca, actually was part of the Dynamics team. Uh, he's, he's oh okay great. He has yep. since moved on to a different part of Microsoft. Uh, because he gets a bigger office. But uh, he, he was telling me that his team was actually very excited by what would be happening in a couple of, uh, back then, 18 months. So this is it. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, this is it's, it. It's not just a new feature set. They say that this this feels almost like a brand new product. So I, mm -hmm. I actually want to check it out. I want to see, I especially want to see how that those integration works. Because if, if they did nail the integration with LinkedIn, um, then that yeah, purchase looks a, a lot deal. smarter than it, you know, some people yeah. might say. 
I know, because we've been talking on the show, you know, like what did Microsoft get when they bought LinkedIn for 26 billion, right? Like right. so far we haven't seen a lot of the deliverables. So here's another place where we are going to see more of the promised integrations over time. Right. And Dynamics CRM has been one of the superstars of the Microsoft Profit Center in the last couple of, of quarters. So, I mean, this this does shed new light on that acquisition. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, does. fingers crossed. Uh, I'm sure you're going to cover it. We're definitely going to cover it on Twilight. Yeah. What about the code name pick of the week? I, I just like the name Volta. <laughs> I have no idea what it is, but Volta, good, good pick. Yeah, so Volta is the pick. And here's an interesting little factoid for Microsoft historians. Microsoft had something codenamed Volta before. Back in 2007, they had something, Project Volta. It was a Microsoft research project about, quote, stretching the .NET programming model to the cloud. So that kind of has happened over time. Um, but this new, there's another Volta now. And this one is for people who are enterprise customers who use Microsoft Premier support. So I, I started hearing about Volta. I, I kept hearing Microsoft Premier services is undergoing the biggest change in the past two decades that, that has ever happened there. And I'm like, what? okay, what is this Volta thing, right? If it's so huge, like what, what is it? So it turns out it's a new commercial support program for business customers called Microsoft Unified Support. The real name is much more boring than Volta. Um, it's an overhaul of how Microsoft's selling premier services. They're trying to make it easier for customers, especially ones who have cloud um, services mixed in with their contracts. So like Microsoft continues to try to do with the store, they also continue, continue to try to do with their licensing, which is make it simpler, make it not like hundreds of pages of documents, make it more understandable by normal human beings. And this premier uh, overhaul is part of this. I'm gonna be writing about it on my site um, probably in the next day or so. Uh, they've started already rolling this out to some customers. So US, UK, Canada, Germany, France, Australia, Sweden, and Mexico are starting to get this option now. And they're saying it'll be totally rolled out by the end of fiscal year 19, which is next June. So June, is that right? Fiscal, no. <laughs> yeah. I think it is. It, yeah, this yeah, year, yeah, July. Next June. And, uh, yeah, next, beginning of July. July 1, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, by the end of fiscal 19. Okay, so that's yeah. 20 in 2018, right? Wait. I what? always get confused. <laughs> Microsoft's fiscal year starts July 1. So now we're in fiscal 2018. Yeah. So, yes, I think so. Correct, correct. Fiscal, by the end of fiscal 20 year 19 is the year after that. Correct. But anyway, it's, it's a work in progress. Um, I have more details coming to my blog post soon. But that's what, if you hear about Volta now, that's what Volta is. Well, I like it. I mean, I, I like the fact that they're grouping together a bunch of different services that will make yeah. my deployment job easier. Uh, yes. I'll, any Anytime they do that, I'm very grateful. It's a good thing. It is a good thing. <laughs> yep. And uh, last but not least, uh, now, I was in Portland for two months mm -hmm. in silence. Uh, yes. And, <laughs> but, in literal silence? It, actually, literally. Li I was literally in silence. Uh, but there was one of the brothers in my house who was going to all the different breweries. Evidently, there are a lot of breweries there uh, are around us. Portland. And yeah. I would see a new growler every day from a different place, <laughs> like the hub and so on and so forth. And he mm -hmm. swore that he knew the flavor of each and every single beer and he could tell you exactly where it is, what it was, and which brewery it came from with just a sip. And I, mm -hmm. then I told him about Mary Jo Foley and he started checking out <laughs> your blog. So you've got a new fan because of beer. Nice. So it only it, it's only right that we end with your beer pick of the week. And I'm not even going to try to, pr to pronounce this. <laughs> I will say I Blueberry Goose. But, <laughs> but other than that, I have no idea how to say the name of the brewery. I know. So um, this brewery is kind of a new to me brewery. It's Destahill, I believe. Destahill. It's D-E-S-T-I-H-L. -E Destahill. I guess Destahill. Destel Brewery, they're in Bloomington, Indiana. I may have done one other beer pick from them in the past, but um, I just recently get to try their um, Blueberry Goes. Uh, the Goes beers, I've, I've had quite a few of them on because they're really good summer beers. Um, they're slightly salty at the end and they usually have coriander in them. And this one has blueberry, a lot of blueberry and also a little bit of lime. So they describe it as, think if you took... Um, a French press and pressed blueberries through a goes style, a German goes style beer. That's what you would get. 
And it does come out this really like bright pink color and um, really, really tasty. Like blueberries and salt and lime and citric flavors all together, very light, um, only 5%. So you could drink a couple of them and still be able to function, <laughs> which is a good thing. Yeah, and I, I really enjoyed it. And I would look for more beers from these guys, Destill. Destill Brewery in Bloomington, Illinois. Now, I, I will That's say on, on Know How, uh, we had a vendor who contacted me over the summer and wanted to send me a, uh, <laughs> it's a new, it's not a brewery in a box. It's not an automated yeah. thing, but it looked like a beautiful glass set of, of uh, oh, well. beer brewing goodness. Nice. Um, I'm just wondering what it's going to look like after the first brew. Cause I, I understand that's not the mm. cleanest of things. Yeah. You have to, well, you have to really be very uh, conscious of not contaminating, contaminating beer when you brew. So you have to keep your environment very clean, but it is messy. It's a messy process it's a messy to make process. beer. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I don't drink it, which is a problem, but I'd love to make it. And you know what? I yeah, would love to make it and then have Mary Jo drink it on air. Do that. I would do that. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> really, don't do it. Well, folks, uh, that's it. We've gotten to the end of this episode of Windows Weekly. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. I, again, I haven't done this in almost a year, although Paul's going to check that out because he doesn't think it's right. <laughs> I, I, it's been a long time. I, I don't know what's going on here. It's, it's, it's yeah. been an absolute pleasure. And, of course, <laughs> uh, we've, we've got Paul Thorat. Uh, you're going to want to go to thorat the, uh, the the premier source for information about Windows. Paul, what are you working on? What what do people need to know about the rot? Well, uh, I, I've been busy moving, so my life has been interrupted, but the things I'm working on that might be relevant to podcast listeners, I'm doing a series on new features in the Fall Creators Update. Ooh. We touched on a few of them on this episode, but there's a bunch more. Uh, updating my book about Windows 10. And I've also got a series, um, because we've moved and changed homes, um, I'm writing a series uh, about the kind of personal technology choices we're making in the house. So we're not going to be like full-blown smart house stupidity, but we're implementing what I like to think of as like common sense smart home stuff where it, you know, where it makes sense. So uh, some smart lighting, uh, we're going to make big changes to the electrical stuff and um, all that kind of stuff. So oh, I love that. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all kicking in now. Wait, where did you move? Pennsylvania. You moved to Pennsylvania. Yep. What part of Pennsylvania? Emmaus. It's outside of Allentown. Uh, is that, wait, how far away is that from Scranton? Okay, so <laughs> I'm not an expert on Pennsylvania, but I believe it is within two hours and possibly within 90 minutes. It's it's kind of probably due north of here. We've got a university there. Okay. And uh, I have to invite you over and we can party. All right, <laughs> let's do it. Yeah. By party, I mean we're going to bust out the Xbox. I, I understand it would, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have beer for Mary Jo. Yes. Yep. And Mary Jo Foley, the author of the All About Microsoft. See, Mary Jo Foley, I said all about Microsoft. I didn't say all about Google once. Or, during or the, Android. Or Android. All about Android blog. <laughs> Not even once, except for that, during the show. Nice. What are you up to? What articles have you been cooking? And what should people know about Mary Jo Foley? Um... Well, it's been kind of a quiet period as it tends to be in August for Microsoft, but we've still been finding lots of good um, things to write about. Lots of things with, like we talked about with Fall Creators Update and what's going on with the Insider programs. Um, we're getting ready to for the big busy season for IT pros to kick off. Next month is the Microsoft Ignite show in Orlando and Paul and I are going to be there. We're going to be doing Windows Weekly live there and doing a meetup. So I'm thinking other the Enterprise too. Beat. Yeah, other stuff too, which is... Um, Mysterious. In the midst of being, yeah, in the midst of being finalized. Uh, but yeah, I, we're going to be kicking off more enterprise coverage because it's this is when Microsoft gets really busy around enterprise, probably more SQL Server on Linux and all that good stuff. Um, Azure Stack, we mentioned briefly during the show. Going to hear more about that pretty soon. So yeah, it's, it's uh, going to get busy on the All About Microsoft blog in the next month or so. So stay tuned. Oh, you're going to be in Orlando. Does that mean that we you're are. going to do Disney World or <laughs> the Harry Potter experience? <laughs> Actually, Brad, Brad and I are going to Disney World. You are? Brad, Sam's and I, yep. Nice. Actually, you might have to come too, Mary Jo, because, you know, we need a... <laughs> you need someone to, to hold the camera. <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. good at that. <laughs> 
Now, if you go to the Universal Studio tour, you can uh, you can see the Ollivander sh uh, show, which is actually a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And if you want to, I I know the people who run the show, so I can have them choose you. Because they always choose someone out of the audience. Oh, nice. And it really ticks off the adults when their kid doesn't get chosen. It's it's I'm actually sure. kind of funny. So like 50-year-old man just runs out to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Like, uh... Well, it yeah. has been an absolute pleasure sharing the field of Windows Battle with you. Um, we're going to have more of this because Leo will be going on vacation in September. And if, oh, okay. if I'm lucky, I'll, I'll get the sub in for him. So, so I'll, I'll be more accustomed to to the, uh, the Windows Weekly mm. Groove. So mm -hmm. we have that to look forward to. Thanks. Uh, folks, thanks for joining us. Don't forget that you can catch the show live every Wednesday at 11 o'clock p.m. Uh, p.m. 11 o'clock a.m. <laughs> Pacific. If you're catching it at 11 o'clock p.m., you're at a very strange part of the world indeed. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, don't forget to watch it on demand at twit.tv slash WW. That's also where you can go to subscribe to the show. Get a version that is suitable for you into the device mm. of your choice audio, video, or high-definition video. It's the best way to support Windows Weekly and make sure that we can keep bringing you all the Windows goodness that's possible. Until then, I'm Father Robert Ballester in for Leo Laporte telling you to take your Windows Weekly. <laughs>